<laughs> well, welcome, welcome everyone. I, I again, I'm I'm Kevin Stokesbury. I'm the chair of the COSA committee for the uh, National Academy of uh, of Science, and uh, I want to welcome you all to uh, to to this meeting and and our our Boehm colleagues. We're looking forward to a couple of days of great discussion. I uh, I thought we'd go around the room very quickly and just kind of uh, introduce uh, uh, if everyone could introduce themselves. And then uh, I'll hand it over to Rodney to, to make a few introductory remarks. So Rodney, we'll start with you, Rodney. Good morning. Good to see everybody. Uh, I'm Rodney Cluck. I'm the chief of the uh, environmental sciences program for BOEM. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Shane Guam. I'm uh, uh, Yeah, um, I'm uh, oceanographer with the Environmental Studies Program. Sorry, I'm sorry. I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. <laughs> uh, Jeff Ryden, uh, Chief of the North Minerals Division at Bell. Sorry, let's pause for a second. And everyone in the room, can you just make sure that you're not on the room uh, that you're not connected to audio uh, on the bottom left of zoom the where your audio thing is you can leave computer audio that's the easiest way to do it okay sorry jeff can you go again i think press the uh and press the talk <laughs> sorry. There it is. All right. I think we got it right now. Uh, Jeff Ridenauer, Chief of the, of the uh, Marine Minerals Division at BOEM. Rona Cox, Geosciences and Coastal and Ocean Studies at Williams College. Lori Suma, geologist, retired from ExxonMobil, now adjunct at Rice and UT. Hi, I'm Kevin St. Martin, uh, faculty in geography at Rutgers University in New Jersey. Deb Blixen, National Academy staff with the Board on Earth Sciences and Resources. I'm Susan Roberts, and I'm director of the Ocean Studies Board. I'm Jonathan Tucker. I'm a program officer at the National Academies and the um, uh, study or the interim uh, director of the uh, COSA committee until Stacy gets back in a few weeks. And I'm I'm Kevin Stokesbury. I'm the chair of the COSA. Committee. I'm also the Dean uh, for the School for Marine Science and Technology at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. Hi, I'm Caroline Bell. I'm um, with the National Academy staff on the Ocean Studies Board, and I'm interim um, helping Jonathan until Stacy comes back. I'm Katrin Eichen. I'm a marine biologist with the um, uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks. I'm Karen Ashton. I'm a, a senior scientist and biological oceanographer at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And for now, I'm the department chair. James Flynn. I'm an atmospheric scientist at the University of Houston. Uh, good morning. Jeremy Firestone. I'm at the University of Delaware and in the School of Marine Science and Policy. Hi, Jonathan Lilly with Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. I'm Jessica Bravo. I'm the acting chief environmental officer for BOEM. Hi, uh, Tom Kilpatrick. I'm an oceanographer at BOEM. Yoko Furukawa, BOEM OEP. Hi, I'm Alice Kojima, um, Presidential Management Fellow and Oceanographer for the Pacific Region of BOEM. Good morning, everybody. I'm David Bigger. I'm with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, Office of Renewable Energy Programs. I'm a biologist. And and those of you online uh, are Dan uh, from from COSA. Could you please uh, introduce yourself? Go ahead, Jack. Are oh, you muted? Okay. Good morning. I'm Jack Barth. I'm a professor of oceanography at Oregon State University. I'm a coastal physical oceanographer. And Dan, or is Dan online now? I don't see him. Well, um, Dan Costa will probably be uh, joining us shortly. He was in our previous meeting. 
And then uh, Zoe, we have a... Hi, I'm Zoe Alexander. I'm a senior program assistant in the Ocean Studies Board. Wonderful. Well, welcome again, everyone. And uh, we'll uh, we'll jump off with Rodney uh, giving us a, an introduction from, from Bowen. Great. Thanks, Kevin. Um, well, the first thing I need to announce to everybody, and as I was talking to Kevin earlier, is that our good Dr. Bill Brown Esquire uh, <laughs> retired. So he uh, he decided um, uh, after a long, illustrious career, he had, a, he had enough. Um, so it's going to be uh, certainly some big shoes to fill. As Jessica just mentioned, uh, uh, currently, uh, Jessica Bravo is the acting chief environmental officer. Um, <clears throat> Jessica is going to be acting chief environmental officer until around mid-August, and then I will take over uh, until the end of September. And uh, then uh, Dr. Jill Lewandowski, who's in charge of our Division of Environmental Assessment, and uh, the, the director for the Center for Marine Acoustics will then take over for, I guess, a month and, month and a half. And by that time, uh, there may be a permanent selection, you know, for the, for the chief environmental officer. But that's, that's where we are. So big news. Like I said, it's going to be some uh, big shoes to fill. Bill was wonderful. Uh, you know, he was the one that actually really kind of got our relationship going with the National Academy, you know, back in the day. I, I had something to do with it myself. But, uh, yeah, the, I think this has been really, really a great relationship. And we really appreciate, uh, you know, all the advice that you continue to give us. So so I thought um, talking about our kind of our study development plan this year, I, and I know there's some new members. So I wanted to make sure and kind of go through the process a bit how we got here, you know, where, you know, how we make the, you know, these decisions, kind of our timeline. So, so I'll, I'll walk through that with you. And uh, of course, you know, feel free to just stop me at any, any point. Um, next, please. So, um, oh, there it is. Okay. So again, and to remind everybody, the Environmental Studies Program in BOEM is a centralized program. It serves all of our offices, all of our regions. Um, so and, and so in anything related to uh, wind energy, oil and gas, carbon sequestration, anything we may do in the future, the Environmental Studies Program is our mechanism to, to ensure that we get the proper science needed to inform um, our decisions across, across all the outer continental shelf. We spent about 1.25 billion in research uh, to date. Um, our 50th anniversary was last year. Um, and we have a really cool video. It's only five minutes that I hope to show at the end of my, my slides here. Um, about 30 million annual funding, a little bit more than that with the IRA funding that has come in. Um, but there's also uh, some money also got taken away from us. Um, just for bureau needs, so it's it kind of fluctuates a bit, and uh, our procurement processes and how we do it. We do interagency agreements with other agencies, cooperative agreements. Those are usually with universities, uh, competitive contracts with the private sector um, or the National Academy. Uh, we don't do grants because we want a product, we want information we can use to inform decisions. So we kind of need to work with whoever's doing uh, the work for us to, to ensure that we're getting the right information. Next. The pillars of the environmental studies program. Okay, go ahead and go to the next one. I love this slide. There's no way I could do this myself. So I did not do this. Uh, uh, Russell Yerkes did, did this in our, our program. Um, you know, the, the, these four pillars to the environmental studies program are really, really essential. Um, you know, anytime we're developing new study ideas for our study development plan, I really push folks to ensure that the juice inspired. In other words, how are you, how are we going to use this information to inform any kind of upcoming decision, whether that's wind or oil and gas or, or marine minerals. So the, the, the study profiles really kind of need to target kind of the, the, the decision in that way and in no way give up any type of credibility uh, or integrity in, in doing so just because it's essentially applied research. It should still have those utmost levels of credibility and integrity. Um, with a $30 million uh, uh, budget and uh, 
about 3.2 billion acres. Uh, that's less than a tenth of a cent per acre, if you do the math, and I'm rounding up. So uh, partnering and leveraging with other federal agencies, universities is really, really, really important. And we take that seriously uh, using other agencies' assets, whether that's satellites with NASA or ships from NOAA, uh, if aircraft with fish and wildlife, all those are really, really important. And we make all of our science available through our Environmental Studies Program Hub. Uh, and and gov info, um, which I have a link to that in a later slide to, to ensure that all the information goes out to the public, ensure that we're educating the, the public on on our approaches and our science as we move forward. So, next please. We do maintain a, a, some core expertise internally. We have about two hundred scientists, environmental type scientists, social scientists, geologists that. Uh, you know, uh, really are kind of the core of uh, of who we are, and those those are the individuals that really develop the study needs. They could be in our science section, in our assessment section, or in various you know regions. But those are the people that really kind of look and see you know where are those gaps. Um, so we not only develop the science but oversee it throughout the process. Um, and you know, we really think it's important to you know engage the science community again, academic, government, private sector to, to, to conduct the science. So our scientists kind of manage a portfolio of science, science if you will, uh, work with uh, outside entities. When those studies or projects are done with final reports and data, then they take that and do the internal analysis to, you know, for our environmental impact statements or biological opinions or whatever that may be. Next. Partnerships, very important. Go ahead and hit it again, please. Jonathan. Um, again, they're really essential uh, for our success. Um, you know, we don't, you know, we're bummed with around 600 people, and that's about 200 scientists. Uh, we don't have any ships. We don't have any aircraft. We don't have any satellites. We don't have any ray guns uh, and anything like that. Uh, but we have partners that, that that have those type of things. So it's really important for us to leverage and, and partner. And, you know, it's hard to do oceanography without a ship. Uh, or an ROV, but we, we do it, and uh, but it's all because of uh, you know this is really a, you know a, an essential pillar of our success. Next, uh, criteria for study development plan and approval. Next, so in, in going through our process and in developing study needs, study ideas. Um, it, you know, again, it's really important for, you know, the need for the information. Why do we need the information for bone decision making? How is that going to inform us? How are we going to apply that? We also have to look at the contribution to existing knowledge that really going to move the ball forward with regards to what we know in that particular discipline and area. Sound research, concept design, and, and, and methodology. Uh, a lot of times that the methodologies and stuff really are explored in, in these meetings here when we do when we do profile presentations for all of you. We really appreciate that. Is it cost effective? Don't want to spend too much. Limited budget, leveraging funds, partnerships, and we always look at uh, multi-regional and strategic utility. If there's uh, uh, if Dr. Bigger is doing a study on avian biology in the Atlantic, how's that useful in the Pacific, for example? So that's strategic utility and multi-regional use. Next. So every year we do basically the same thing. Um, so I send out a request for stakeholder input. Uh, well, let me, let me back up. First, I send out a, a, a request for input on study, need, study needs to our internal scientists across BOEM. Um, once they kind of start working on that a bit, uh, usually around the end of November or so, I'll, I'll send out a, a request for stakeholder input. This goes to several thousand individuals across the United States, academics, uh, private sector, uh, trade association, fishers. We have a, you know, our, our public affairs you know, keeps a really you know, robust list. Um, so we send all, all that out and, and, and garner all, all these, these ideas. And then our internal scientists will start working on these study profiles, uh, as we call them, that that's in the study development plan, kind of pulling that together. Um, then we do an internal review. I call the internal review our STAR team review, science and technical review teams, where all the um, 
Uh, for example, all the avian biologists will get together and review each other's ideas. All the marine mammal people will get together and view each other's ideas. All the uh, air quality people will do the same. Uh, some of them, you know, if they're multidisciplinary, then we have multidisciplinary star teams, you know, whatever fits. So they, uh, they work together to really improve this. It's not supposed to be like a dissertation defense or my idea is better than yours. The idea is to really, you know, how can we make this uh, study idea the best it can possibly be? Uh, so it's, uh, it's, you know, really intended to be very collegial in that process. Then we released our study development plan, which I sent to all of you, uh, National Academy of Sciences Engineering uh, meeting. Um, that's us, that's here right now, it's happening. Um, and then after we see, we get your advice, we take it back and all the regions and offices will rank or re-rank uh, based on your advice and needs. Um, then uh, I, I take the, uh, well, well, we draw from the studies development plan for a short list, which we call the national studies list. And that's based a lot on budget and, 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 and priorities. And I take that to all the senior executives across BOEM. Um, Try to get concurrence. Um, <clears throat> that's a tough meeting sometimes uh, because I I, I I try to get concurrence. I usually well, I'll say I get near concurrence because you know people in different areas. The Gulf of Mexico may want a lot. Alaska may want a lot. Pacific may want a lot, and they kind of got to hash it out. Um, but we always get there, and then I take it in front of the director for approval. Um, once once she approves, we begin the the procurement process, and then uh, in the November December. And then we start all over again. So that's how it goes. Next. Um, so, you know, the, the plan is, I, I, I call it, a, you know, it really is a, an annual strategic planning document. It, it allows us to really capture our ideas and, and, and put them down on paper for the next year or two um, while you know, looking forward. Um, you know, we identify information needs, prioritize these needs, uh, you know, and it really is a good communication tool. Anytime I'm, you know, trying to work with other federal agencies, Department of Energy, for example, I can always lay this out and say, this is what we're planning on doing next year. You know, where do our interests align? I'm getting ready to have a meeting with USGS and the same thing. Where do our interests align? And that really allows us to leverage and partner. Um, so, it really is, the SDP is the foundation of our national studies list. So it's a really important tool. Next. Um, I think you got to hit it again, decision context. Um, again, one way we really prioritize is, is, is to look at this decision context, which is, is in this uh, document. Um, you know, if there are upcoming decisions, you know, on, on siting or, uh, so certain kinds of impacts that are needed for a wind facility and, you know, in a certain you know, geographic area, we really need to target our studies to inform those decisions. Uh, so we really look at these upcoming decisions, uh, try to understand what's needed, um, you know, what's needed for NEPA, what's needed for any type of compliance or information needs. And then that's built into the science strategy for each office. And that kind of leads to the proposed studies. So again, these are, you know, done in a way where we're, you know, reaching out, but also really looking, you know, what information do we need to inform decisions? That use inspired model kind of you know, feeds all the way through this. Next. Uh, 53 uh, proposed studies this, this year, uh, five Alaska, eight Gulf, Marine Minerals, eight, uh, OEP, Office of Environmental Program, 17, Renewable Energy, seven, Pacific Office, eight. Next. Uh, the priorities that we kind of put forth this this uh, time around, renewable energy, of course, 23 in there uh, with that. Looking at environmental monitoring and cumulative, that's really important, especially as built out is, a, is occurring for offshore wind, uh, kind of, you know, uh, put people, you know, or the, the, the charge I put forth was, you know, think about monitoring, think about cumulative, think about those as we're moving forward, 30, 30 uh, profiles, and then in innovative technologies and techniques you know, whether that has to do with uh, eDNA or certain types of uh, satellite uh, telemetry or artificial intelligence. It's coming. We need to use it as effectively as possible. So there are studies in here that are building in those technologies and techniques. Um, and 18 proposed studies uh, have came up with that stakeholder input I talked about, external input, 
13 for external stakeholders and six federal partners. And if you do the math there, it looks like one was both. So to add up to 18. Uh, next. Uh, new and upcoming activities, uh, carbon sequestration, still working on the rulemaking there, expansion to US territories. Uh, we sent out a call um, for um, uh, an, an initial call for like pre proposals last month. Uh, study ideas for, for pre proposals are due August 23rd. We sent that out nationwide. Um, so we're looking forward to getting those in. Uh, and we'll use uh, IRA money to fund those. I think that's about uh, five million, six million. Um, we got on the horizon um, green and blue hydrogen, um, multi-use activities. That's multi-uses on any particular lease. And then there's these plans that the federal government have put out: the Ocean Climate Action Plan, National Aquatic eDNA Strategy which we've had people involved in the writing of all these. And I spoke at the National EDNA Strategy at the Smithsonian uh, not that long ago, <clears throat> last month. Uh, ocean Biodiversity Strategy and Sustainable Ocean Economy. So all these are, are new strategies across the, the federal government that kind of can, can inform direction. Next. And again, uh, can serve 50 years of coastal ocean uh, science uh, on our uh, ESP hub. Uh, so all of our documents are out there. Next. And now, do I have time? To, 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 uh, I talked longer than I wanted to, but did, did, did we have time for the video, Kevin? Okay, uh, Jonathan, see where it says 50 years of ocean stewardship? Click on it. And fingers crossed, it works. I'm sure it will, because Dr. Lilly put it together, so it's got to. <laughs> Oh, and thanks for this video. Jennifer Ewald on our team did a great job uh, with Truescape, uh, a company called Truescape to pull this together. So thanks. I think we, some volume. Yeah. Oh, sorry, that's me. Fifty years ago, we set out on a quest to broaden our knowledge of a realm that is in mystery and intrigue. This realm is vast, and it does not easily share its deepest secrets. The inner workings of its complex ecosystems affect everything we do. For thousands of years, it has provided for us and inspired us. From the surface, to thousands of feet below, we've embraced its environment and shared in its wonders. The ocean has been a bountiful provider to mankind, but how do we know when we have taken enough? How is this vast body of seawater that covers 71% of the Earth's surface, from its shallow coastal areas to the deepest abyss, affected by our activities? and our dependency on its ability to provide for our ever-increasing needs. 
Understanding the ocean environment is critical if we want to understand how much our oceans can continue giving and, importantly, how much it is able to take. To answer these questions, we've spent half a century studying this realm through our Environmental Studies program. BOEM's mission is to manage the development of the U.S. Outer Continental Shelf's energy and mineral resources in an environmentally and economically responsible way. This area occupies under 10% of the Earth's ocean, and as the ocean ebbs and flows within this zone, it washes up against 95,000 miles of shorelines, supported by complex ecosystems which are rich in biodiversity. Just as the ocean's ecosystems maintain the intricate balance of life and the environment, we've also adopted a balanced approach to what we do. We are focused on ensuring that renewable energy, oil and gas, and mineral resources continue to support our nation's economic growth and national security. Having awarded over 3,000 studies and funded more than $1 billion in research since the inception of our Environmental Studies program, we have gained a deeper understanding of the continental shelf, building on and consolidating our knowledge by adhering to the cornerstones of scientific integrity, trust, and accuracy. The success could not be achieved without the support from a broad range of committed professionals and supporters Partnerships underpin the program as we strive to balance the needs of society and those of our ocean ecosystems. A balance that can only be achieved by utilizing the knowledge we have gained of this vast and mysterious realm we call the ocean. Over the last 50 years, we've benefited from the incredible advances in science and technology. From space, we're able to monitor and map the mammals that roam the ocean using satellites that are the size of a coffee cup. The ocean floors are being mapped in ways we could have never dreamed of just 10 years ago. We are gaining insight from our tribal nation partners who have passed on their affiliation and understanding of nature from generation to generation. The industries that rely on the ocean have invested resources and time to build on this body of knowledge the outcome from these initiatives, based on science, informs our decision-making, ensuring that our nation's dependencies on our oceans have a minimal effect on marine life or their habitats. We are proud of the advances we have made in the 50 years that this program has been operating. We will continue to build on our success while upholding our vision to realize ocean stewardship through science. Okay, that's it. Uh, I, I like this video. It's, it's pretty good. I thought yes, it was a good video. I think they did a good job. Good. Yeah, it's so very in uh, inspiring there. Congratulations. Yeah. Okay, thank that, you. That uh I I I I know how hard it is to put those kind of videos together and stuff and no and what to say we did that for s mass a while ago and myself on film was <laughs> terrible remind me of the rocker short you know it was just it's like the rocky or picture show but anyway um well great well so we're gonna jump in but just before we jump in is there any any kind of overarching questions especially for the new committee members uh for rodney and, and congratulations jessica and rodney on the <laughs> your up upcoming role your roles yeah good I don't. We'll do the best we can. Oh, I'm, I'm, I have no doubt. Uh, any any comments or questions from the committee before we we move on? Well, I I will ask that. Yeah, I so Rodney and I spoke just off, off uh, before the meeting started up, but um, we were talking beforehand, and we were wondering if if the Chevron decision uh, has any implications in our in our discussions for the next two days, and. Uh, you know how it like would it would it impact the, either the decision for these um reviews or or um 
is it something we should be considering? And I think at this at this time, um, well, for the study development plan itself and for our science ideas, it's really not going to affect what we're doing here, right? Because we're again, we're doing use inspired science to inform decisions, then uh, you know we're still working working towards. And um, uh, you know we've 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 got our decision context and our direction moving forward. So I, I see no impact for you know from our our study profiles. Um, I think the election will have a lot more of an impact moving forward. Uh, but again, well, I think we're going to stay the course uh, for, for now and with our science needs. That's not to say that the Chevron deference won't have effects on a case by case basis in the future, of course, with different with, with, with certain projects. But for our, our, our science needs at this time, I don't really think it plays into it. Hope that helps. Yeah. Yes, very much so. And, uh, and of the 53 proposals, the, these ones you selected for us, how, how were they picked? Kind of... um, we throw a dart at a board. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, so, I, so I, you know, we have um, monthly meetings, sometimes more often than that, with all of our offices and all of our regions. We have science chiefs and all of our scientists get together. And I basically just tell them, you know, um, select the studies that you would really like to seek advice on talk to your folks talk to your people talk to your scientists and you know uh some of those studies are going to bubble up uh, there may be a, you know a certain study and somebody says you know i'd really like to engage the committee on this you know um, because i'm really kind of struggling on on the best methods to, to, to move forward with or or uh you know or you know maybe is you know is there other work done in this area that i'm not familiar with for example so i just you know kind of direct folks uh to um you know select studies that they really would like to seek advice on that might be you know over, overly really complex or controversial that you really think the committee could could help with and, and then each office and region selects their own you know so it's uh, it's them so it's kind of the scientists but it kind of bubbles up through through, through each office with that that high level direction Wonderful, and that that will help with our our, our ability to give advice too. And, and but uh, also, please know it. You know, we're we, we'd love to get any input from from any study profile, or you know, in in the whole plan. So you can comment on anything in the plan. But that would take us a week to go through every fifty three right. studies. So that's why we just select certain ones to present to the the committee. Fantastic. Okay, if there's anything, oh, sorry, yes, please. So, so when you were describing how the process works, at one point you said, okay, we get these study plans and then, um, well, we get all the avian biologists together. <laughs> I'm wondering how many avian, you know, like what's the, how many scientists are there at BOEM in the different disciplines? Because there's not that many people who study birds. I mean, there's a lot more pe people who study you know, basic biological oceanography. I know that. But, yeah. You know, I was just wondering like how many people. I use that example because David was sitting across from me, I think. Uh Oh, how many avian biologists do we have? David, five? five. So, so those five will get together and, and you know, share, you know, um, uh, journal articles, share information or like, oh, I'm, I've got this one study going on and, you know, I'm getting an interim report, uh, you know, that it's, it's, it's leading me in this direction. So it really is about sharing. You know, we have more acousticians that will get together and do it. When I, when I first came up with this idea for the uh, this idea a long time ago, uh, I, I called it the subject matter expert teams, and that's kind of what you know we called it in Bohm. And there would be like all the biologists would be like you know fifty going around reviewing every bird study, every marine mammal study. I mean, it was just unwieldy and too many. So we really kind of tried to slice it a little thinner and say you know okay, the avian biology folks, the acoustic people, the marine mammal folks, and, and tried to make it a little smarter. Usually, your ideal team is what five to ten. So we try to in those ranks and it's usually most effective in that way Does that help yeah and then I, I have another question which yeah. i've asked before but so the all these plans that we've seen are anonymized we have no idea who put them in and as i'm looking at them i'm wondering well i really hope that nobody in my department put one of these in and i don't you I, i'm just wondering how do we are you talking about the study profiles the, the ones we're reviewing those were written by our folks they were my, yeah. Okay. Now we, we do send out, you know, a uh, like I said, the note to stakeholders for input on maybe gaps or what information we're missing. What should we do? But those are just kind of paragraphs, you know, with just a study, you know, yeah. maybe a concept there. Uh, our folks have to take that 
and you, you, you and pull that into a study profile into their format. So these, uh, you know, are written by by our people internally. So these are these are ours. And there, once anybody submits a comment, by the way, uh, I, I put a little disclaimer at the bottom. Anytime I send out that note, that the idea is all the property of the federal government. Great. Dan had a question online, and then we'll we'll move into our first presentation. Hey, Rodney, I was curious when you pick projects to to put forward, how many of them are proof of concept, like you're going to develop a technique that isn't being used, but could be used, but versus taking more, um, you know, mature technologies and then applying them. So how much are you interested in, in developing something new that's taking a risk that it may or may not pan out versus taking existing methods and then putting them into play to answer a, a question you have or a, a a need, a need that needs to be resolved. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely okay, uh, and I think we all are with taking risk, and I think people should be taking risk, um, especially in a time, you know, that when we're dealing with uh, fast moving uh, technologies and innovation. That's that, you know, things, things such as artificial intelligence. Um, I think one, one could probably get an idea. I, I think I mentioned that. Um, 13 of the studies or so had you know, really a strong innovation type of, uh, uh, you know, uh, backpinning to it. Um, so it, it's a bit of a mix, but, uh, you know, the, the, a small percentage, maybe maybe 20% or so might, might have that type of new techniques. I think it's important to do it and take, uh, take risks, but at the same time, we don't want uh, our, our studies program is so limited, Dan. We don't want to take our studies program and invest all of it in, in new technologies. We have to have use-inspired science to inform decisions. If if you know there are certain studies that a new tag needs to be developed or whatever, and we're working with um, you know Fish and Wildlife or Department of Energy, and we cost share on that, and that will allow us to do the science in a more efficient, effective manner and save money down the road then all that would be considered. Um, but I would say, just to answer your question, just probably look at those studies that are that I, I tagged as innovative technology. Yeah, I sensed, I sensed that you were doing that. That's why I wanted to make sure it was, I, if I figured it was a clear strategy you had. Thank you. You bet. And, and we will take one more since it's from uh, Ruth uh, Perry, who's also a, a COSA member. And I do want to welcome Ruth. Uh, she, she's just jumped online, so go ahead. Thanks for that. Sorry, I couldn't be there in person. Um, currently living with no power up at the office. <laughs> um, and uh, Hurricane Barrel had other plans for me getting to DC this week. So sorry to miss everybody. Um, Rodney, maybe I wanted to kind of pick up on Dan's point, and this may have been answered. I apologize for being late. Um, how is there a formula or other kind of quantitative approach? to prioritizing the studies based on management needs. Because I think um, some of the challenges, as you know, that's been through iterations of this committee is the applied science for management decisions and then you know the science to answer other types of questions and where is that balance? So I was curious if there's a more kind of strategic quantitative process or formula that BOEM applies because it gets a bit abstract when you look at what can be submitted by stakeholders, then what BOEM has proposed, and then what we're kind of seeing in the committee to see how all of those things are linked against the formulation that BOEM is working, if that makes sense. So yeah, I was curious if you could highlight that a little bit. That's a good question. So really, you're talking about the difference between Applied science and hypothesis testing, in a sense, to management decisions, right? And and how is that balanced across the regions and across you know administration priorities? Because uh -huh. a lot of those factors evolve, right? Some every four years, some every one to two years. Then you have budget cycles. Mm -hmm. So is it qualitative in terms of how BOEM gets it to the final process, or is there you know more quantitative? Formula, formula approach. Well, there's not strategy. a model. There's not yeah. a model that spits it out, Ruth. That's for sure. I, I, I would call yeah. it more more qualitative in the sense if we take wind, for example, you know, Energy Policy Act 
past this 2005 you know we have jurisdiction we haven't really operated in the atlantic for a long time what's the first thing you do baseline so you start collecting baseline you know working with NOAA and others we got the big studies of a maps going on looking at protected species transects from maine to florida you know doing doing that but uh, so that's kind of one of the first things that you do but then kind of one of the second things is uh, start thinking also about you know um you know what are the impacts here uh, you know, uh, what are going to be the impacts on the benthic ecology from, you know, all, all these cables that are going to be laid. So then you kind of start thinking about, you know, uh, impacts and and doing um, modeling, kind of predictive modeling. Uh, right now, we're transitioning into kind of to a new phase. They're out there building stuff right now. Monitoring. How do you how do you really monitor the ecosystem and ecosystem change and understand cumulative effects from all these projects together? And that's when I think, Ruth, we turn to, uh, you know, folks like you and, and developers uh, to help us conduct, like, for example, passive acoustic monitoring for, for the long term. So um, I, I kind of th I think about it in, in, in a sense of kind of um, maybe phase of development activity with, you know, looking at uh, the, uh, you know, what's being developed, like, for example, wind farm. Uh, and 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 the, and the assessments needed to inform decisions. Um, I think a, a, a part of that, you know, up front, you know, um, after adequate baseline is um, collected, maybe maybe not even adequate, but at points, you know, you're going to have to have to start doing predictive uh, modeling and understanding for your NEPA analysis. So I think it is kind of a qualitative, more of a qualitative approach. I'm happy to talk to you more offline, but that's kind of my take. Great. Well, we should, to at a respect for our invited guests too, we should probably jump in and we're, we're a couple of minutes behind. So uh, with that, uh, thank you. And uh, um, Des, Desiree is, is going to introduce, introduce the first topic, I believe. Yes. Good morning. Thank you, Kevin. Hi, everybody. I'm going to share my screen. Fingers crossed. Could I have uh, permission, please? Jonathan, or? Yeah, you should be good now. Okay. okay. How's that? That's good. Sure. Sorry, everybody. Is it Monday? Okay. Good morning. Sorry for the, the tech. It had to be me. I am the gremlin attracting device. Um, that's as far as sort of our stretching technology, um, Dan, that you were talking about. Just put me in there and I will make sure it breaks. Um, Good morning, everybody. I'm the marine mammal biologist um, at BOEM, and I have been with BOEM with 11, for 11 years. I recently transitioned to the science coordinator position in the Office of Renewable Energy Programs. And as Rodney was mentioning, some more big shoes to fill after um, Dr. Mary Boatman retired. So pretty much thank you, Rodney, for that wonderful um, opening and introduction. Again, since the, the audience has varying levels of familiarity with BOEM's Renewable Energy Program, I thought it would be helpful to provide some background information. Um, as you all know, um, as Rodney has wonderfully laid out for us, BOEM is the bureau within the Department of the Interior that oversees the development of our energy and mineral resources um, on the nation's outer continental shelf, which extends from the three mile line of state jurisdiction out to the full extent of the EEZ. We at BOEM are responsible for the expeditious and orderly development of the energy and mineral resources on the OCS, including renewable energy like wind. It's our job to ensure that this development is done in an environmentally and economically responsible way. As you all know, offshore wind development has begun in the Atlantic and is emerging in the Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific as part of the global effort to reduce carbon emissions and slow down the pace at which the climate is changing due to the warming caused by these emissions. So as Rodney clearly presented, with any proposed method of energy extraction, we need to understand the potential impacts of offshore wind development on the environment. And we have environmental stewardship deeply seated in BOEM's regulatory authorities under OXLA, the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act, and the Energy Policy Act, also as Rodney mentioned, which is actually the act through which BOEM has the authority to permit energy resource extraction from resources other than oil and gas, like renewable energy. As you can see on the screen, we have approximately, um, or exactly, 35 commercial offshore leases issued. 
with nine records of decision having been um, basically approving projects and construction began in the Atlantic last year around the sort of May, June or June, July timeframe. But how did we get here? Um, whoops, that was a little too fast. Um, Bohm's Renewable Energy Process incorporates multiple phases that include planning and analysis, leasing, site assessment, construction and operations, and eventual decommissioning, as you see laid out on the screen. Environmental reviews are undertaken throughout this process and require the best available science in order to inform environmental assessments and decision making. As Rodney has clearly mentioned this morning already, but just to reiterate, BOEM's environmental studies program as mandated by Oxla allows BOEM to proactively support mission-based science that informs how BOEM manages these resources. The ESP covers an extensive portfolio um, as Ruth already asked about you know, the, the, the folks that are at BOEM covering physical oceanography, atmospheric sciences, biology, protected species, social sciences, economics, submerged cultural resources, environmental fates and effects. We are inc incorporating it all under the, the ESP. Moving specifically into offshore wind, and, and you know, folks have already asked these questions about how we identify the topics. Um, Rodney's already gone into that about, you know, the intergovernmental task forces, public meetings, formal information solicitations, through BOEM subject matter experts and recommendations that actually come out of BOEM studies and final report deliverables. And of course, additionally, we highly value the input from the COSA. So these priorities then are, are identified in our annual studies development plan and that becomes publicly available on BOEM's website. To date, BOEM has provided over $80 million for research related to offshore wind development. And again, Rodney touched on this topic as well, which is partnerships. So it's, it's good that we're all on the same page. Um, partnerships are really key to the success of the environmental studies program. And to continue to meet the environmental needs of an expanding and nascent offshore wind industry, we really are at BOEM encouraging seeking regional collaborations among research partners to conduct regional monitoring and data analysis in the Atlantic. And an example is the Power On study, which is a, a passive acoustic monitoring study to look at potential impacts um, on cod and marine mammals in wind energy areas using uh, passive acoustic monitoring and collaborating with partners to create an observational network. And this is supported by another entity called the Regional Wildlife Science Collaborative, which was cooperatively established and led by four sectors, including federal agencies, states, ENGOs, and the offshore wind industry, and is, is really proving to be um, a really important um, sort of mechanism to help us move our partnership and monitoring vision forward for offshore renewable energy. The profiles that Dr. David Bigger and Dr. Shane Guan are gonna be presenting to you today will evidence these partnerships, while at the same time explore new technologies. Dan, take, pay attention to this one. This is part of your question and novel approaches to help bomb monitor environmental inter interactions as offshore wind construction and operations evolve. So thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to the presentations. Jane, yeah, I made it some time. Do you want to share your slides yourself or do you want us to run them for you? Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, morning, everyone. Um, thank you. So uh, my name is Shane Guam. Um, I'm with the... Uh, Boom in my studies program. Um, today, I'm going to give a talk on the uh, uh, utilized uh, distributed acoustic sensing technology to uh, monitor uh, large whales in the uh, renewable energy area. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so, a little bit of background of the uh, distributed 
distributed acoustic sensing technology, or DAS. Um, it's a relatively new technology that uh, utilizes the uh, fiber octave sensing tech, uh, fiber octave cable is already in place to uh, detect, uh, to uh, get information from uh, vibro acoustic disturbances, such as uh, you know, seismic um, waves or marine mammal calls or shipping noise. Um, so the uh, basic concept on that is uh, for, you know, any uh, fiber octave cable is used for uh, information uh, for for uh, telecommunications, uh, you can fit uh, what they call it's a, a interrogator at the shore terminal of this cable, um, and then you send a series of very short laser pulses through the uh, so one of these uh, dark cable with the spare cable that is not used currently used for communication, and if these uh, you know if there are somewhere along the cable line. Uh, if there is any vibro acoustic disturbances, um, what I'm, uh, which means you know any uh, mechanical waves, uh, sound waves, one of these uh, mechanical waves uh, impinging on the cable, and it would cause uh, uh, back scattering for these laser pulses, and we we, we make them you know causing sh uh, phase shift, and then you know from the shore you can detect this little macro scale a uh, nanoscale phase shift and inversely to get information from you know uh, where are the acoustics uh, signals in that region um it can it's you know be pretty uh it's, it's been established that you can you, you can detect at least the frequency low frequency from you know one millihertz to uh all the way to probably above one kilohertz it's still a uh, technology that actively uh, being developed. Um, next slide, please. So for us, boom, um, the critical information needs we have is you know, we need uh, uh, to understand the potential environment effects on marine life on large scale, uh, long-term uh, offshore and renewable energy development. And currently we are ha investing heavily uh, um, uh, traditional passive acoustic monitoring to understand uh, the marine mammals um, uh, distribution and uh, movement and the potential behavior, uh, you know, whether there is uh, from the offshore wind development. Uh, one study uh, that we just uh, mentioned as example is, you know, we're developing the regional uh, passive acoustic monitoring network. Uh, we implement uh, uh, deployed, um, we will be deploying many hydrophone arrays in these wind farm areas. Um, however, you know, uh, this large scale um, investment is uh, can be costed um, because you need to purchase a lot of sensors, acoustic sensors, um, and also you need the ship time um, to deploy these sensors and maintain these um, equipment and retrieve it um, to get the data. Uh, so uh, it can be ex extensive, uh, expensive. Next slide. Uh, just another, piece. yeah. So we're exploring the use of existing um, fiber optic cable to gain the uh, acoustic information using DAS technology. Um, this is a, a map that I uh, got for the internet and that's showing, you know, there are a lot of uh, fiber optic cables uh, being laid by telecommunication companies and other industries. Um, that potentially can be used for uh, passive acoustic uh, monitoring. Uh, no, next slide, please. Uh, so the study objectives uh, is uh, the first is validating the uh, DAS-based um, technology to uh, detect marine mammals and especially uh, low, uh, low frequency large whales uh, to uh, against you know the traditional knowledge um, in the wind farm areas. And the second objective is to supplement to the uh, existing investment, you know, such as the uh, Atlantic Regional Pan Network to get additional information on uh, marine mammal acoustic um, behavior. And the third, if we are, all these are successful, uh, we are thinking about maybe uh, establishing up, up establishing an operational protocol for long-term uh, large whale uh, monitoring, acoustic monitoring in uh, offshore wind development area. Go ahead, another next slide, please. Uh, so the methods, uh, you know, the first will be uh, 
working, you know, if this study is be funded, we'll be working with the uh, offshore wind developers to see, you know, uh, add any of the uh, uh, fiber optic cables that can be used for this study. Uh, then uh, we'll work with the researchers to uh, install the interrogators on these uh, short terminals of these uh, 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 fiber optic cables, um, collecting the uh, DAS data and to analyze the DAS data to address uh, specific research questions. Uh, this includes the uh, balloon well uh, distribution and movement and uh, potentially uh, behavior status, behavior change, uh, absence of presence. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, I think you can just keep pressing the, yeah. So the, we have the six uh, uh, research questions. Uh, the first three of these are uh, mainly focused on the technology de development. Uh, we would like to know, uh, can the uh, DS technology be a reasonable alternative for the traditional pan uh, for the to collect uh, marine mammal um, information at the offshore wind area? Um, if this technology proves to be a low cost way um, to study whale distribution movement and the behavior and how can it be widely used for the environment impact studies. Um, and also it'll go beyond uh, from just detecting marine mammal vocalizations. And uh, we, we try also to see if we can, that can be used to understand other uh, acoustic, um, uh, yeah, this, uh, uh, other uh, acoustic sources in the wind area that include you know, uh, construction noise, vessel noise, um, wind farm operation noise, as, um, um, as well as uh, uh, you know, geophysical phenomena like uh, micro size um, and uh, waves and wind. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. Um, uh, so the uh, the last three uh, questions is mainly focused on the uh, you know, uh, biological uh, questions on, on whales. Um, if you know from these data sets, um, if we can address you know understand do baleen whales avoid the wind from uh, construction areas or wind operation areas, or alternatively they may be attracted to these areas due to the uh, different uh, 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 due to the uh, shifting in, in pre-species. Uh, if there's a measurable change in balloon whale distribution across the uh, offshore wind areas, um, can we derive whether this change uh, was due to offshore wind development or a different ongoing um, stresses? And finally, uh, we're looking at the, you know whether this changes um, uh, the whether there's any acoustic behavior or behavior ecology change in whales in the areas. Um, yeah, next slide, please. I think that's all I have. Um, yes, go ahead. This is an empty one. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. I, I have time working on the questions. Great. Thank you very much, Shane. Um, we we have uh, several guests uh, that we've invited to to comment on this. Uh, Hannah Meyer, uh, uh, Pernia uh, Rattilia. I'm sorry if I pronounce that incorrectly. And uh, William Wilcox, are, are they online? Would they like to comment, please? Um, yeah, this is Purnima McCreese, and I have a question. Um, can you please uh, explain um, uh, why it, uh, the frequency ranges are limited to between, um, I think you said, 1 millihertz to 1 kilohertz? And um, what happens uh, with these detections at higher frequencies uh, above a kilohertz? Yeah, uh, my understanding is that current technology is not able to uh, detect uh, higher frequency um, in uh, higher acoustic frequencies. Um, I, uh, I I have to uh, get some more references to to see uh, what the physics of that. But uh, it's, uh, it's first when the technology was developed it was mainly used for to detect the uh, earthquake and seismic uh, micro size. These are extremely low frequencies, um, but there are you know a reason the few studies they they tested uh, they were able to go in above one kilohertz, but uh, not um, not beyond. Uh, so it's the amount of disturbance to the cable. Sorry, Dan, Thanks was that for the a... presentation. 
Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. sorry. Go ahead. I'm sure I'm not an expert on this, but it's a wavelength thing. Is you're measuring it as physical disturbance. The cable has to move a given distance, and at higher frequencies, it, it's not going to move much because the wavelength is, is so much smaller. So low frequencies are going to cause a, a movement in the cable, and so it's just basically a, a fundamental physics of scaling of size. The the actual physical disturbance that they're measuring is going to be harder to measure at higher frequencies because the the distance, the disturbance is much smaller. Um, I think also it's a wavelength dependent um, because the high frequencies have a much shorter wavelength and they, um, ha they're probably attenuated um, at the depth of the fiber. Um, but, but my question, another question I have is, um, do you have any um, idea of, uh, you know, uh, how the detections are dependent upon uh, the, the depth the fibers are buried? Because I know that they lay them on the sea floor, but over time, um, you have you know uh, wave action and other processes that um, you know cause the fiber to get uh, you know covered with sediments and so on. Um, do we have an idea of you know how that will impact um, the detections in the low frequency end? Yes, this is an excellent question. Um, uh, unfortunately, I don't have the answer on that, but definitely there is the cable with the, with the physical. Uh, shifting of the, uh, the the substrate and the cable um i i you know i understand this definitely yes there would be a change in the detection sensitivities and uh interestingly you know, some of the uh existing studies that uh, uh, i read is actually uh, at least some of the studies they really don't know whether these cables are were exposed on the seafloor or potentially buried um so yeah this is uh uh an active research area. Hopefully, you know, in the uh, next few years, can be addressed, and that's also you know bringing to the uh, the 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 relative uh, short uh, I guess shortcoming of these technologies. Like currently, we can know uh, where the disturbances are, uh, where the the sound is coming from, but it the calibration, you know, the we we probably don't know the uh, relative not right i mean we probably don't know the absolute uh, uh sound intensity in that area because the sensitivities we we don't know you know how the the, the cable depth or whether it's exposed cable or barrier cable would um uh would affect the sensitivity so. um i have another question is the technology dependent on the whale depth um, you know, like the, the, I would imagine that um, probably when the whale is, you know, closer to the sea floor, um, you know, it's going to be uh, much higher intensities um, at the uh, at the depth of the fiber. Um, is it? Uh, but, but let's say the the whale is making sounds at a shallower depth. How, how does that impact the 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 uh, signal reception? Yeah, I think uh, the uh, you know like any acoustic sources uh, sources uh, and receivers the uh, the intensity is uh, you know has is clearly related with the uh, the propagation depth of uh, propagation distance. So if the um, the source is closer to the cable, yeah, definitely you will have a strong response. When it's far away, it may be difficult to uh, detect. Thank you. Great. I'm going to call on uh, Hannah next uh, because I, I think she's been trying to ask a question for a bit. Please, Hannah. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the presentation, Shane. So I think in my mind, there's every reason to think this will be successful for detecting a lot of the baleen whales of interest in this area. But especially with North Atlantic right whales, I think one of the major benefits to expanding the acoustic monitoring network is moving towards real time capacity. So I'm interested in, um, as you're developing this, if you're looking towards um, a workflow that could be transitioned to real-time monitoring to trigger you know, acoustic slow zones and dynamic management measures, especially to um, reduce probability of ship strikes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, my knowledge is, uh, my understanding is that at the current stage, there's no way we can do it uh, in real time. And it's also the um, signal processing, pretty intense, intensive signal processing. So, uh, it, you know, it, it could, it may be able to get you the answer um, where absence at presence in probably maybe um, days, uh, but not real time this stage. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, William, would you like to ask a question? Um, yeah, well, I'd like to comment a little bit about the sensitivity of DAS to different frequencies, um, because I think it's been very well tested in the seismic community, where people are interested in tens of hertz. Um, and then that can work out to 100 kilometers or so. But if you have shorter cables and sense to shorter distances, you can get to higher frequencies. And I don't think that's been very well explored. So I think it would be really useful as part of these studies um, to actually deploy an artificial source that you can control where it is um, to, to, so that you can actually see how, how to how higher frequencies you can record. And I also think it would be useful because a very large volume of data comes from these systems. So to explore developing edge technologies so that you can actually analyze the data in real time. And I wondered whether that might be part of this program moving forward. Great, thank you. Uh, and anyone on the COSA committee, uh, Dan, did you had it, your hand up and then lowered it. Do you have another comment or, or anyone else? Yeah, I, I had a few comments. The previous comment about working with a Norn so source, I think, is quite quite critical because how else are you ever going to really know the efficiency of the system and the the characteristics and the a, a lot of the other questions that were just asked previous to that are only going to be established when you have a known source and you're you're, you're uh, doing a sound receiving capability. A, a couple other questions I had is how many dark fi dark fiber cables are there? So it's one thing to show all the existing fiber optic networks, but how many of those are actually available to be to use in this way? And then the the other aspect that I was wondering about is, are these sections, can they sectionalize what, what part of the cable is being received? In other words, to be able to localize where the sound is coming from, you need to be able to localize where your receiver is. And so are these long, if, if, it's, if it's the cable is over a long distance, are you integrating that sound over kilometers rather than over a few meters? That's gonna be really critical in order to determine where the whale is which is critical in order, and you need to be able to establish where individual whales are in order to start to do some population assessment and or where, where they're moving from. And yeah, and then, and so, I mean, I have talked to some colleagues and uh, there is a lot of excitement about this technology. And I guess part of this study is to, to just see if it'll work. But again, I think that use of an orange source is really kind of fundamental because you both know where it is and, and uh, the characteristics of what sound is being produced. And then the other comment I had gotten from a colleague is that it's expensive. And so the question is cost benefit. There are established systems that we are putting out in the ocean. The NOAA has acoustic soundscapes and there are other tools out there if if we're using an existing cable network, that's great. But is the the cost of the high intensity signal uh, processing is that going to be the amount of data crunching that has to happen to make this useful? So I mean, these are all questions, and maybe the study's going to going to answer those. Leave it at that. Great, thanks. And Jack, you had your hand up. It was very related to what Dan asked early on. He said, "What cables?" And so my question is, where and would you where would you start? What what have you identified for first cases? Um, Aaron, you had a question. Oh, I'm sorry, Jeremy. I didn't see yours. Yeah. Uh, it, it seems to me that it would be good to do the feasibility study to see how many cables there may be available out there before you launch into a, a, a full study. And I guess the other question, you know, related to that is, are these fiber optic cables more likely to be on the export cables, uh, which would be 
not really within the or so much within the array, but but going to shore, uh, or they, or or would we expect to see the fiber optic cables in the inner inner arrays? So that that's going to be an important uh, distinction, um, and obviously you you mentioned as well about wanting to get an understanding for uh, the whales movement around the arrays, we would obviously want to have some control to know what was happening before the arrays were were constructed. So uh, obviously they, the cables will be laying uh, before operation, but it would be really important to get those the the, the acoustics right away to get to get that baseline in between the time where the cables are laid, the fiber optic is laid and uh, the beginning of operations in order to have, have a control. And Karen? So uh, two th things came to my mind. And one is we are talking about real time and, and a detection or analysis. And we're doing that right now with <laughs> passive acoustic monitoring. So I think that's a really important piece that should definitely be taken on because it, that's what would really make this useful. Um, and then another thing that comes to mind is it would be kind of interesting to, for the, to, when you try it to actually have some of those other passive acoustic monitoring devices say deployed so that you can do a comparison between what they find in terms of the whales and what this technique finds in terms of the whales. Cause that's, you know, we're using them a lot now. We've got them on gliders. We've got them on moored instrumentation buoys out there all up and down the East coast. And, um, but this, the, I thinking that the advantage of this big long cable is that you can have so many more places that you can detect these baleen whales or any kind of other, you know, you could go beyond to other kinds of marine mammals as well, as long as they vocalize. And so it'd be really amazing if it actually worked, but let's, you know, we, we can try it and make sure it is doing what we want, but definitely, I mean, otherwise you're going to have so much data <laughs> that it's going to be impossible. So I think really going together with real time automated detection of what you're listening, hearing is going to be critically important because unless you're only sending out one pulse every hour, I don't know what you're, what the, that was also wasn't in there was how often this, the pulse is going to go out, but you could get a lot of a lot of stuff on there and it's going to be, you know, you're going to have to have automated detection. All right. I, thank you. I, I, I don't, um, Shane, I hope that gives you some ideas to, to help build on. And I want to make sure that the you know committee and everyone understands that um, this is a, a dialogue and you can, you can write comments and, and reach out to individual committee members and follow up with these ideas. I, that's happened with me a couple of times in the past and really, really uh, productive. Um, but I think in the interest of time, if it's all right, we should probably move on to David's presentation because we are a few minutes behind and I do want to re be respectful that the uh, the guests have jumped on to uh, at a certain, certain time slot. So uh, if that's good, we'll, we'll move on to the, the next presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, I gave slot. Oh, excellent. And so I can just say next slide. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> um, we aim to please. Well, no, good morning and uh, thank you everyone. And um, uh, and uh, the title of, of this study profile is Integrating High Quality Movement Data from Proxy Species uh, into SCRAM. So what's SCRAM? Um, but I'll, I'll get to that. And um, uh, next slide, please. So for some time, BOEM has been working with Fish and Wildlife Service scientists um, to better understand uh, migration patterns of, uh, of, of uh, listed shorebirds like piping plover, uh, red knot, and rosia tern. And our efforts include like putting geolocators on uh, the well, so the first geolocators on uh, red knots, tracking them from you know Terra de Fuego, traveling from uh, Terra de Fuego, going all the way up to uh, Delaware Bay. Um, been setting up the uh, MODIS uh, telemetry uh, uh, network to uh, which is an acoustic uh, well, 
which are, uh, was it uh, VHS uh, receivers to pick up uh, birds that have been put with transponders on them, um, including for the uh, for these same species, piping plover, red knot, rosia tern. And then about five years ago, we started uh, to work on uh, a, a stochastic collision risk model called SCRAM. Um, that uh, uses this tracking data to predict where, um, to predict uh, actually the relative number of bird fatalities at offshore wind, uh, wind farms. Now, however, the, the movement uh, data that's used in these collision models um, uh, have some shortcomings and uh, the precision of the data, the geolocators, for instance, is quite low. It, you know, a couple kilometers, uh, it's about 100, 100 to 200 kilometers. Um, the MODIS network, relies on stations that are on shore that have about a 20 kilometer range. Um, and, uh, and although, you know, currently there are developers and others who are using, who have actually managed to use satellite tech, uh, satellite tags on some of these birds right now, um, that the, uh, the data aren't yet available. So the study idea is uh, to explore how some existing high quality uh, tracking data from uh, ecologically similar species could be used to fill in the information gaps and, and reduce uncertainty in, our, in the offshore movements. So uh, let's, next slide. So well, BOEM needs this information uh, to, uh, to inform its uh, environmental reviews as required by NEPA, um, it's, uh, as well as its ESA consultations uh, with Fish and Wildlife Service. And to date, um, it's about probably about nine of them. Uh, all uh, all the biological opinions from uh, the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service require BOEM to update and improve uh, the collision risk mod, uh, models. So, and then I'd like to add that um, Fish and Wildlife uh, also uses these models to figure out these collision models uh, to estimate take and to uh, estimate the amount of compensatory mitigation uh, that is needed to offset the take. So next slide. So currently the, you know, we have low quality movement data being used in SCRAM. And so the first objective is to obtain high quality tracking data from proxy species to describe the movements of the piping plover, red knot and rosia tern. Second is to expand of the utility of SCRAM uh, by adding more uh, bird species. We just have three, those three birds. And the third objective is to develop approaches to validate uh, the SCRAM model predictions. So next slide, please. So the plan is to identify the proxy species that have high quality data sets, compile the data sets, uh, to model the overland and um, offshore movements, and then to integrate that um, uh, that information to SCRAM. And so, as an example, on the left, I have some uh, red knot uh, data from uh, from the MODIS network. And the uh, and we see of the uh, was the green dots are locations of stations that have detections. Uh, there are thousands of stations, um, and then the the lines are the uh, uh, depict flight lines between uh, between stations. Now, to the right, um, have a uh, to, now just to the right are the flight paths of several. Um, because it's a little hard to see uh, wimberls uh, that were fitted with uh, satellite tags, um, and this is the the a proc an example of a proxy species, and. From these, if you squint, um, you can see, <laughs> you'll see that the uh, that the the flight paths are much more are are, are uh, much more fine scale, and you can distinguish between onshore and nearshore movements of birds uh, from from these uh, from these satellite tags. Now there are several data sets. This is not just the only one of four or four Wimberall. There's others for uh, Godwits. And there's uh, other possible species that that could actually be used. So on the to the right of that, I have uh, rosia terns, 
which is uh, ESA species, so it's having the uh, some data from the MODIS uh, from MODIS data, and then to the right of that we have common turns and like uh, and and like rosia turns, common turns uh, they go uh, and fall travel south and uh, to uh, spend the winter on the South American beaches. Um, and so again, we have, uh, there, well, there's, there's several data sets and including we also have a study right now where we have satellite tags being put, uh, that are not being put, they are put on uh, some 60 satellite tags put on, uh, on common turns um, uh, in uh, Cape Cod. Um, so, so there's a lot of existing efforts and we want to try and integrate this stuff. Um, let's see. So last slide. Oh, next slide. I'm sorry. So, so val So, then lastly, what we want to do is try and validate some of the, the prediction, uh, the predictions because, so, you know, it's really impossible. It's really possible. It's really difficult <laughs> to, uh, if anything, to, to, uh, to count bodies of birds on the ocean, so um, and which is which is a common practice on land. Uh, however, there are tens of thousands of wind turbines on the in the U.S. We have high quality data showing uh, showing um, uh, showing where uh, uh, tracking information where birds are moving. Uh, this is an example this year from. Of, of red knots that people grabbed right on the beaches in this in uh, uh, I think it was uh, South Carolina, and they put uh, satellite tags on these uh, on them and track them as they go. And you can see they these these animals we pa are passing over uh, where several uh, wind farms are on 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 the map. So the plan would be to expand the scram model to cover the offshore environment. Uh, excuse me, the onshore environment. And then to develop approaches that uh, to validate um, its predictions using the the bodies uh, the body counts from the carcass surveys, and so that's the that's the general concept. And see, uh, and I think last what's the next slide? Research what yeah, what's the efficacy of using data from others? Yeah, <laughs> from from proxy species uh, for data specific. Uh, data specific to federal listed species. Um, you know, again, there's, there depends on how people feel. Uh, people feel you should be, you know, be, uh, what was it? Uh, some people want to be specific, use data that is very specific to that animal. Others uh, feel that you can be a little, uh, you can stretch it out to bird, to animals that use, uh, uh, that, that are similar in that sense. So that's why we want to look at this and see where we can run with it. And I think that's, that's it. I think it's just that foam slide and then an information slide, <laughs> but thank you. If you want this, but that's, if you want more detail. Great, thank you very much. And uh, we do have a guest uh, invited to to comment on on this proposal. Uh, Autumn Lynn uh, Harrison, uh, would would you like to make a few comments? Sure. Hi, David. Thanks for that presentation, and thanks for inviting me, everyone. Um, I'm the principal investigator on an initiative that was mentioned in the study plan the Shorebird Science and Conservation Collective. And the good thing is that uh, we've done a lot of work already to compile available shorebird tracking data for conservation uses. So over the past couple of years, we've been funded to bring data together and apply these data to conservation. This has already happened in partnership with Canadian Wildlife Service for their risk assessment models for, for wind energy development. So we have a good sense of what data are available, the quality of data for these species. Only about 18% of the tracking studies that we have found for shorebirds are currently open access. So we also have a process whereby we work with data collectors to get their permission for use in initiatives like this. So that process and data sharing agreements is all pretty well established. 
Uh, there's a preprint of a paper about this process that I'll share with you as well. So you can see the data distribution and, and see the, the GPS and Argos quality data that are available. Thank you. That would be great. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the study plan will, I think, rely on those data quite substantially. Some species have better data than others. Um, many of the species that have GPS quality data still have large temporal gaps. So they may have spot high spatial accuracy, but low temporal frequency, um, which can affect uh, some of the inputs to the models. But um, but I think we would we would need to be a key partner on a study plan like this. And we've already been talking with with Pam about about some of these topics. Um, one thing to keep in mind is most tracking data for shorebirds don't have altitude. And so when you're thinking of studies for the future, that's an innovation and in technology that would be really useful to actually tell what the potential collision risk is. Great. But. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll... Uh open it to the committee to see uh, uh, does anyone have any comments i i actually have one to to, to begin with uh, um because you know we, we do kind of the same thing in fisheries at times where you're trying to do uh look at species especially species that are less common and, and look at it but behavior of course is a really big key thing some of the you know and and, and i would think that that not having the, the 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 level of flight of these different species i mean are they actually uh, you know, flying on the same, same level or, or, I mean, that's a, that's a big one. I would think it certainly is like, like, for example, haddock and cod are very similar. And yet turns out that one swims up and the other swims down when it approaches it. So there's a whole separation, uh, net separation, um, design that Noah put out based on just that particular behavior of two species that are very similar, uh, morphologically. No, that, that's that's an that's an excellent question because uh, there's because there is a uh, I would say a deficit of uh, of of uh, of uh, flight height information of how high some of these fly. So returns and like I would just throw out things off returns in general they fly relatively low, um, generally around twenty meters or so high. Um, for the red knots, it's been a kind of a a, a, a road to discover uh, or a uh, an interesting path, a roller coaster ride. So people thought that they were flying. Oh, they're flying, you know, three kilometers high and all that stuff all the way through. Some of our from our studies actually with the uh, and the work that Pam Loring has has done, where they calculated actually flight heights using the, the MODIS technology, was found that they actually could be flying much lower. Um, the some work that developers have put on, uh, they put actually. Uh, uh, like for instance, uh, 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 red knots put um, put GPS on uh, the satellite tags, and they found that they were that they they kind of fly at various heights too. So, it, but it's hard. But again, it's going to be hard to figure out since that part is evolving too, and then the scarcity of the information. Yeah, that's that that's going to be a challenge. <laughs> I, I I imagine it, and and the other thing uh, just from observing uh, uh turns in the way they if I, they 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 school and they and they or they they flock and fly uh you know there uh, is there a, a a aggregational component of it because I, again using the fishery example in the herring fishery they're trying to avoid river herring and you'll get many many cases where there's there's an avoidance and then one one set will will catch all river herring and and that'll be the end of the the the, the fishery and i'm wondering if that 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 schooling behavior or that flocking behavior with with uh with would be similar between species it could be yeah <laughs> i'm thinking of because right now i'm thinking of like there's always exceptions yeah. um but uh it could be so that would be an element we have to put in and see to try and match behaviors i was thinking mostly of of the migratory behaviors of when they yeah. when they uh stage 
let's say in fall, and then they move on down south when they are likely to pass through the area, uh, pass through these areas, or when they fly north, when they go, uh, you know, fly from the uh, overwintering spots, and then and then land, um, and, and then land. So when they actually could pass through where the where where the turbines might be, uh -huh. um, uh, so something like the like the red knots would just move across, piping plovers will just move. Uh, roseates or other terns might move but hang out for a little bit or something because they can do that so um i'm sorry i i have been kind of hogging the question that catherine you had had one and then uh, dan has one yeah uh, it basically was very similar to what you were saying um sort of just more generally what is sort of what are your criteria that you are putting into your matrix to dis determine if something is a proxy a valid proxy species or not and you went to some detail there but i think there can be a number of both um behaviorally uh spatially temporally whatever components so i think it would be very important to create a matrix and and try to be inclusive rather than exclusive uh in in that um because i i understand the the problem that if you don't have the data or sufficient data for the species of interest you try to go to the next best thing but in order to make that useful it actually needs to be, they, they need to be an actual proxy. So. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's really helpful. Cause as I was even, as we, as I was thinking through this, I was thinking about this problem too. Does it have to match exactly the species or just the stage that you're interested in or, or the threat level is? So for instance, should, is it a good enough proxy if it, if it goes in for fall migration? But doesn't have to be for spring or something on those type of levels, and that would be. And it doesn't have to match the whole species in that way. It, you know that the, that's what I was correct. But knowing that and and being specific about it would probably increase your the output. Thank you, Dan. Uh... Yeah, I do. I've, I'm involved in similar work with marine mammals, not surprisingly, and so there's a number of issues that I think this is. Let, let me just say. When you don't have any data and you need to make decisions, you need some place to start. And so I think Scram is a great place to start in the absence of any information. What I find most concerning is if then it, if things stop there, because we've we've been involved in studies where we collected data 10 years ago with a limited data set. And now people are thinking, that's it. We know everything we need to know about the movement migratory patterns of these animals. They change, they change with time, they change, the ocean is changing. So I, I think it's critical that once Scram is created, that it's a that it's a ongoing effort, that it can't be, oh, we've done this once, we've picked our proxies and it's done. We've we don't need to do anymore because we all know the ocean is changing. The the other thing I'd say is we already we saw several different technologies presented to us just now. One of them is MODIS, one of them is GPS, and one of them is satellite tags. They're very different. MODIS requires, is a close proximity receiver when the bird flies near the source. And that's why you saw these very straight lines across the ocean. That's not the track the bird flew. That's just connecting the dots. The exciting thing about MODIS is, and this is something to think about in requiring offshore wind, is to put MODIS receivers on, on the offshore platforms because they're going to pick up birds that are carrying these transmitters with them. And so for the future, MODIS holds a lot of uh, exciting potential. MODIS is a much smaller tag than a GPS or satellite tag. That's why people use one or the other. There's a lot of small birds that are too small to put a GPS or satellite tag on. That's, that's why we have these different technologies. GPS is the best it's going to give you the highest resolution track. That's what you would ideally have for all these species. And then in terms of picking proxies, understanding the life history of the bird, just not just that they are migrating and migrating through this path. There are many birds that have similar migratory cor corridors, but the way they migrate may be different. Already we've heard about the, the where they are in the, in the, I was about to say water column. <laughs> you could tell I'm used to marine mammals where they are above the water, whether they're stopping along the way, whether all those things are critical. Uh, so picking the right proxy is 
is uh, really relevant. And then I'll, I'd finally end by just saying, Scram would be a great tool to identify data gaps. You know, where do we really need to get more information? And one last comment is maybe studying animals where we have the best, maybe Scram's gonna do this, looking at the animals where we have the best data and comparing that to uh, body counts. How good is just, because all, all this tracking data is gonna give you is animals moving through the area and some species may be better at avoiding wind turbines than others, but just knowing when you have a migratory corridor, what's the proportion of birds that get killed uh, in the migratory corridor is, is again a critical question. But I, I think everybody's identified some really good issues and, and I think studies like this are very important. Thanks. Just a quick question. I was wondering, like, how small a bird can be tagged, you know, because piping plovers aren't very big. And they were mentioned in here, even though I don't think they have any tags on them. And I also know that they're very endangered because they're all over the Cape and we have all these places where you're not allowed to go because of the piping plovers. But you can see them on some of the beaches where you share space with them and they're really cute and little. But I, you know, I don't, I was just wondering, if, like, will those little, whatever, they, the last tags that Dan just mentioned, can they go on a piping plover or is that too much for them? The, the modus tags can go and, and, and they've been, then they've been used on there. The, the, uh, the other tags, no, not yet. <laughs> maybe, maybe before I retire. <laughs> well, and, and, and imagine getting the permit to put one on a, on a piping blower. I mean, yeah, yeah, that, uh, that's another issue. All right, run. This might be a really naive question, but I, I know they use radar to track migratory birds and, and you get a pretty good sense of numbers and where things are going. And I'm just sort of wondering if there's a way to integrate the Scram or MODIS tracking on individual birds with the flock, the large scale, non-specific data that comes out of the radar to give some kind of insight perhaps into flocking associations that might be helpful or not? It's not a naive question. Oh, it's a good question. <laughs> oh, that, that's really good. I haven't thought of that. <laughs> So thank you. No, that's that's really good to to integrate the both or or to inform to form the other one or the other. Yes. And last question. Yep, just another quick question. Um, you know, roseate roseate terns and and uh, or piping plovers and red knots. I mean, they're pretty high visibility species right now, I and mean, there must be a bunch of groups out there trying to study their migration patterns. Do you feel like you've tapped into um, all the, the groups that are mainly doing those studies? Yes. Yeah. Oh, they're, they're on, uh, sorry for the pun, <laughs> everyone's radar. Um, and uh, the, uh, even, even the developers are even keenly aware. They're, they're trying to figure out working with the CERT, with Fish and Wildlife Service and us trying to trying to learn as much as we possibly can, yeah. Great, thank you very much. I, I hope that's useful comments, David, for your for your proposal. And I, I have to say, once the puns start, it's time for lunch. So, <laughs> so we'll, uh, uh, and I, Autumn, thank you for your comments and the other guests on the on the earlier proposal. Uh, I, it's 11, or one fifteen now, so we, Oh, is it 12.15? Yeah, which is right. We're right on schedule, aren't we? Gosh. Oh. It's like Grateful Dead song, isn't it? Yeah, disaster nearly avoided. Um, great. So time for lunch, and uh, then we'll be back at, at 1.15 to continue on with the discussion. Thank you, everyone. It's the latest. Sorry, it's all incorporated into the building. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the Cosa Boehm meeting. Uh, and uh, we're right on time. I hope everyone had a good good lunch and, and I was able to rejuvenate after our uh, morning discussion. Um, so we're going to jump off with 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 uh, Brad. Brad Bly. Um, pardon me. Oh, is that right? It's going to be Yoko, yeah.
All right. Well, um, pardon me, uh, Yoko, uh, to, to, to start off, um, please. Yes. Um, so, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone had a good lunch, and I hope all of my speakers are online. I'm not seeing them, but I guess there are more pages than just that. So, yeah, so I'm here to introduce the study profile portfolio from the Office of Environmental Programs, OEP, and to set the stage for the three OEP um, presentations. So now the OEP profile, OEP studies are a little bit unique. So our regional offices and program offices, they are focusing on, on trying to answer the questions that are directly related to the offshore resource management projects that are either ongoing right now or upcoming soon within the next few years or you know, at least in a short period of time within their regions or programs. So we heard from Des this morning about um, the OREP portfolio, and I think we're going to be hearing from the Pacific office later today, and we have Marine Minerals, Alaska, and the Gulf of Mexico tomorrow. So, but ours is a little bit unique. Um, our focus is, um, so like I, I can categorize our focus in perhaps three classes. So our first category includes studies that are national or cross-regional in scope and applications. So these include many of the acoustic studies and studies that are in, um, informing the national oil and gas program, and also our multi-agency partnership efforts, such as the National Ocean Oceanographic Partnership Program, NOP, NOMEC, which is the National Ocean Mapping, Mapping Exploration <laughs> and Characterization Strategy, and the National Marine Diver Di Biodiversity Strategy that was just published a few months ago. So these are um, our first class. So, you know, informing the national scope um, um, problems and interests that we have. And our second class is uh, related to um, BOEM's emerging responsibilities. Um, so many of our work in the U.S. territories could be categorized as our emerging responsibilities because with that, you know, that just came to us with the IRA. And also this class includes the um, our uh, newly granted authority to manage the OCS carbon sequestration as well. And finally, our third category is the studies that will enable us to to adopt the emerging and innovative technologies such as ENA. AI and marine um, AI and machine learning, and also emerging remote sensing technologies. So um, today we'll be hearing uh, from three OEP profile authors. So we will hear from Jake Levinson on the profile that has a cross regional and cross program implications, but also at the same time it is also an adaptation of our AI machine learning capabilities, emerging AI machine learning capabilities. And also we'll hear from Melissa Batum. Um, she will be discussing our emerging responsibility in carbon sequestration and also the challenges of understanding the background CO2 flux versus the potential carbon sequestration related CO2 flux. And you know, attribution is a big issue there. And also we'll be hearing from Holly Wecht and her NOAA colleagues. Um, on their profile to operationalize the emerging satellite-based emission monitoring technology. So, um, you know, the, the ones that we're hearing today are indeed a good cross-section of the OEP profiles, OEP responsibilities, but also we specifically have um, selected these three profiles to bring to you today because these represent new directions and new paths for us. So we're interested in hearing your opinions and insights on um, if we're on the right track or not, whether these profiles may stand in, um, where these um, profiles stand in relation to the greater scientific and social um, context. And also, um, you know, if you have, if you see anything else that we or the profile authors haven't seen in these profiles that you might be able to advise. So we really appreciate your engagement and insights. Thank you. And with that, I think we are going to Jake first, yes. right? Yep. Jake. 
Hi, thank you. Can uh, can everybody see my screen okay? Good. I just want to make, confirm that everybody can see my screen and hear me and all that. Yes. We're good, thank you. Yeah. All right, awesome, great. Well, uh, Yoko, thank you for that. And uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to uh, to share this study with the committee today. You know, uh, I always appreciate uh, the chance to, to share some of the cutting edge science that we do uh, that really kind of make that our strive for our first in class uh, environmental organization. Plus, I really enjoy the uh, the opportunity to just generally science geek out with y'all. So uh, thanks for, for uh, including this profile. And I'm sorry I'm not there in person. Uh, like the other studies that uh, some of you may have seen me present over the years, uh, this one kind of seeks to innovate our current methods of impact assessment and how we do our science to accurately reflect the natural world. In this case, we're talking about the organization of sperm whales uh, and how they organize themselves in the wild. Uh, sperm whales are an often overlooked ESA species that we're learning is present on, on shallower shelf waters uh, where we used to think they were restricted to deeper areas. So if we're working to reduce takes and aid in recovery, if we want to manage for survival, we really need to manage for cultural diversity, not just genetic diversity. And what's really amazing at, at sort of the unique juncture that we find ourselves at now is really that transformational power of AI and machine learning to avail potential space, spatial mitigation options that otherwise we wouldn't be able to, uh, to assess. So like the presentations uh, you saw before and uh, the ones I'm sure they'll come after me, uh, we'll follow the same outline here. Uh, we'll give a little introduction to sperm whales and, and, uh, and the, the problem that we're addressing. What is the specific bone in, uh, information need? Uh, the objective, uh, the research questions we'll, we're posing in this, and the methodology and overview of, of how uh, I'd like to go about uh, uh, carrying this out. So, but first, really, we should start with a, a little background on sperm whale population structure. So the current definition of stock, uh, according to the MMPA, is uh, a group of whales that are genetically similar and share a common space where they can interbreed when mature. However, uh, uh, when we define stocks that way, we're homogenizing across cultural barriers. We're defining populations arbitrarily and not based on the realities of nature. And sperm whales are organized in a way that's sort of analogous to, to how humans are organized, where you have a social unit that is analogous to a human family. You have a clan that might be analogous to a human uh, uh, ethnic group, where you have a, a community or, uh, that's made up of individuals who share a common cultural background. And then you have a population that covers sort of a geographic area. All these are whales. Uh, they're all the same species. But within these, there are subcultures just like humans. And there's an important connection to fit fitness here because uh, different uh, uh, clans, uh, different uh, uh, groups uh, respond differently to environmental stressors. They're not all the same. Uh, uh, so th there's an important connection to fitness. And I guess there's a similar analogy to killer whales and while I'm not a killer whale expert, um, uh, you know, you can have populations of killer whales that uh, will that are starving. They'll swim by a perfectly good king salmon and ignore it. But because their grandmother's grandmother's grandmother taught them to only eat coho salmon, they'll starve to death while perfectly good food swims by. Um, the point is really is that we've known for some time that, that selection really happens at the cultural level. And when we treat these as the as the stock, we're treating everybody the same. We're we're sort of doing a disservice to so we're not accurately uh, accounting for how they are in nature. And clans are demographically distinct. Uh, when something happens like El Nino or an oil spill, it affects one group differently from another. So we really need to be assessing these groups as individual specific groups as the socially learned differences in groups impact their behavior and fitness overall. And we've seen this happen with uh, the impact of El Nino on some clans, but not others. Uh, you know, management has been based on, on genetic uh, populations or stocks. And our, our understanding now really is that uh, the most obvious uh, uh, unit for managing these, these, uh, these animals is really uh, uh, at the culturally, cultural boundary level. And it's really vital for Bohm to know uh, because currently we don't know the spatial distribution of clans, right? It could be that we have some spatially restricted clans that are all consumed and just uh, in a few small lease areas. Or maybe we have clans that move about the OCS. To understand the cumulative impact uh, that we're having uh, to these animals, we really need to understand the distribution uh, at a finer scale. So I realized talking about culture um, uh, and spatial management uh, might seem, a, a, it's a lot to wrap our brains around. So I wanted to take a second to share this analogy. And um, 
that clans are demographically distinct and react to stressors differently. And uh, uh, I think of it a lot like baseball fans. And being a Boston Red Sox fan, this analogy is really painful for me. But let's go to an example in New York um, uh, that will, uh, just for an example. Uh, in New York, you have Mets and you have Yankees fans. Um, uh, they both live sympathetically in New York. They both live together. They're both important to New York culture. But they're different. Mets fans uh, uh, are generally considered more working class fans and what Yankees more white collar. Um, they have very different rates, home ownership rates. Um, they, where they rent homes, they have very different uh, uh, amounts that they pay for rent. Uh, their behavior and habitat use are very different. If you flew over them and counted them, you would just count people. But the reality is they're very different. Um, now, if you wanted to, you could use computer vision and you could sit there with a camera and uh, use computer vision to map the spatial distribution of baseball fans. Uh, by reading, but you could do so by reading their hats. And we'd get a map of how all these fans uh, uh, could do this. Well, instead of computer vision, we can use machine learning and artificial intelligence now uh, to uh, map uh, uh, sperm whales um, because we're already collecting all the information that's needed to do so. It's just a matter of doing the analysis. So just like humans, we're all one species, but we have different levels of vulnerability driven by cultural boundaries. So in this example, you know, we could define those boundaries using the, the hats, what, what hats people wear associated with their teams. In the case of sperm whales, it's marked by dialect. So we can define boundaries acoustically. The point here really is that when you make a management action, whether it's building a new stadium or putting in uh, uh, wind turbines, it affects different sympatric groups that live together differently. But right now we're counting them as all the same. That's kind of a failure. So sperm whales live in this hierarchical society mediated by this complex communication system. It's a sequence of cliques known as codas. And we can determine the group composition um, uh, using those codas. In this case, we can identify clans um, by the different types of codas uh, 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 expressed. So uh, clans can live, like I was saying, in the same waters, but they don't interact. There's a social boundary. I can try and play this here. I'm not sure if it'll come across, but let's try and play this real quick. Can you guys hear that? No, no yeah. we're not hearing it, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Um, uh, just picture a bunch of clicks. Um, but what you saw there was um, uh, one of uh, like Hal Whitehead's recording from the Galapagos where you had the distinct sort of four plus three codets, you know, four snaps and then three more. Um, and so you can tell that there's one specific kind of coda that's being expressed. And the other acoustic example that I had here for you was from the Eastern Caribbean, where you've got sort of that four plus uh, four plus clan identifying, and that's just a few seconds. We've got you know hours and hours and hours and terabytes and terabytes of uh, acoustic data that could be gone that could be that could be analyzed to understand this. So, what's the bone information need? Um, really, it's are, are we having dis disproportionate impacts, but treating them as one incorrectly? Like I was saying, when we fly over, they're all whales; they're all equal. But similar to like similar to how we see with North Atlantic right whales. Not all whales are equal. In the case of North Atlantic white, right whales, we're talking about mom-calf pairs. In the case of sperm whales, we're talking about variable vulnerability amongst clans. The ESA and the MMPA requires us to take into consideration the differences in sensitivity of the different cohorts to a protected species population. So like again, with right whales and mom-calf pairs and with sperm whales with clans. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the statues require us to uh, understand the impacts um, and but we, you know, uh, don't put a lot of attention to that sperm whales because we've generally uh, assumed that they're uh, uh, only occurring in deeper water. But because of all the passive acoustic monitoring happening now, we know that they're present uh, uh, in shallow water too. Uh, so uh, we, and we know, and we also know that they're present when we uh, long thought they weren't um, in some areas year round when they never we never thought they were before. So we've got this really unique point in, in, in history right now, this really unique point in time where as, as offshore wind is, is picking up and machine learning techniques uh, are, are happening faster and faster, uh, it's enabling the analysis in, in other areas of the world that, that's happened in, uh, uh, that's, that's happening outside the US that we could bring here. So the objective for our study is, uh, is pretty simple. Let's map the clan movements in the OCS uh, to determine if activities are impacting the clan distribution and composition uh, of sperm whales. And so with that in objective in mind, um, our research questions really are, uh, 
uh, to better, to, to really to better understand things like the cumulative impacts and the spatial distribution of sperm whales, we want to we want to update the CODA library of uh, of sperm whales uh, that hasn't been touched since 1977. Um, uh, how many? So we want to find out how many unique CODA types can be identified in the existing uh, passive acoustic monitoring. Uh, we want to look at the machine learning techniques and uh, and perform for the automation and detection of, of of codas. This is something that is has even been uh, uh, a step forward. That was even taken uh, uh, is is happening quickly and and uh, was there was just a published paper on this uh, this past spring. Uh, and we want to know the distribution or movements of both plan tracked um, uh, based on the those unique codas. So when we detect unique codas. In, uh, in the Gulf of Maine, for example, can we detect them again uh, uh, in the Mid-Atlantic um, uh, across multiple uh, uh, receivers? And uh, does the presence of these unique vocal clans vary before, during, and after wind energy area construction? And then of course, what's the importance of spatially overlapping areas? So where do vocal clans uh, uh, overlap with wind energy areas and do some vocal clans have a much more restricted, uh, much more spatially restricted area than others? So how will we go about doing this? Um, the uh, maybe it's my own bias sitting here on the East Coast, but we'd use the uh, Atlantic OCS makes for a pretty prime uh, demonstration area um, uh, with all the monitoring that's happening. Uh, we also have extensive PAM data uh, from the Atlantic from both NIMS and BOEM from both towed arrays that we've done uh, uh, in studies uh, and in, in NOAA cruises, and also from uh, stationary bottom-mounted uh, recorders uh, that are happening all over the, the Northeast US. Uh, and the, we'd up, the first thing we, that we'd need to do is update the library of unique codas um, uh, that, uh, so that we can compare that to what, it, what was recorded in 1977. Uh, and that 1977 was just dipping a hydrophone over over the side of a boat a few times. Uh, it certainly wasn't what we can do today. Now, what's really exciting about this, and, and the part where I sort of geek out, is that there have been uh, really amazing developments uh, in the machine learning world uh, that provide a, a foundation for how we can get this done here in the U.S. So there's been a lot of developments outside the U.S. that we could bring to us here. So, for example, uh, in 2003 and 2016, uh, there were publications on clan level vocal identities of sperm whales. But then the really exciting stuff started happening in 2019, uh, where we saw a publication of deep learning techniques for detection and classification of sperm whale codas. Uh, and you might have seen in the news lately, even this past spring, um, uh, that uh, machine learning was enabling uh, uh, the machine learning was enabling to understand sperm whale phonetic alphabets through the automated detection and classification of their unique codas. Uh, and that was in the, in the Caribbean. But my point is here is that you can uh, use this process, you can use machine learning now to uh, process these amazingly large data sets that we're already collecting uh, that are really just too big to wrap our heads around. And not only does it enable us to wrap our heads around it, but make meaningful improvements to our management mandate. So, you know, we use machine learning and computer vision and, and, and other things uh, really, I, I think of it a lot as a very surface level uh, uh, activity. We're, we're using it for uh, picking out species or, uh, or individual, you know, right whale photo ID type things and things like that. This is a chance to dig a little deeper into uh, the intense amount of acoustic data that's collected and make meaningful spatial, you know, lines on a map, uh, which is at the end of the day, what, what BOEM does a lot of. Um, what's also really exciting is, is really that transformational power that these techno technological developments um, make, uh, make possible for improved mitigation and uh, improved planning. You know, what that picture is, is uh, this was released last spring, is the new uh, NVIDIA Blackwell processor. And I don't know if other folks geek out on this stuff as much as I do, but uh, this is uh, uh, able to process trillion parameter large language models. Uh, at, at a fraction of what it's cost in the energy consumption that it has in the past. So it's something that's available um, uh, uh, to use now and um, uh, really enables the ability to, to just chug through uh, inconceivable volumes of data um, uh, 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 with, with greater ease than ever before. So with that, that's, uh, that's my presentation. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, great. Thank you very much, uh, Jacob. It's really interesting. We do have a couple of guests, uh, and so we'll uh, 
I uh, will ask them to uh, comment first, please. Uh, uh, Peter uh, Tayak and uh, uh, Patrick Miller, if you guys are online and would like to uh, uh, comment mm -hmm. and, and question, welcome. Please go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go Thanks ahead, so much. Me. Yeah, I'm happy to start with a question. So the Westell paper, I think, which is what you take off from, uh, did a really interesting job of finding, uh, detecting sperm whale clicks on a continental shelf waters using the echolocation clicks of sperm whales, which have a source level of about 230 dB. They are designed for very long range echolocation and can be detected at ranges of 40 to 80 kilometers. Uh, Coda clicks are designed for very short term communication. They're more like whispering. The detection range is estimated at more like four kilometers. So if you compare the area over which you detect a coda at four kilometer radius to an echolocation click at 40 kilometers, that's 1%. Right. And the highest rate of detection of clicks that Westell et al found, and I'm glad to see that you're here, Annabelle, because uh, you, you're the one who actually has access to the data, was about 0.1 uh, days detected. That, that would suggest at best, your estimate would be using the data source you're looking at, one in a thousand days. When, when sperm whales are there, if they make codas at the same rate as clicks, which they don't, they do fewer, right. you'd have one in a thousand. So I question uh, the wisdom of focusing on coda clicks because of this massive acoustic difference. And from a policy perspective, I think to me, to my mind, the, the weakness of the Westell paper and the, clearly the next step would be actually doing localization. It had to estimate range based on how loud the received level was and to model that. But we have very well established techniques to actually localize sperm whales and see how far away from the energy uh, areas they actually are. Uh, and I'm not sure, I'd be, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts of, if you're measure, if there is a localized clan in that area and you measure the impact in that area, what more do you learn by going to a huge effort to try to establish clans Versus, isn't it a higher priority to do a dose response study and get better idea of the effects of uh, the wind development on the sperm whales who are resident in that area? We, and we've done a lot of work doing dose response curves on quite variable populations. Sometimes we don't know why some individuals are different from others, but we can use multiphasic dose response curves to capture the, the responses of the most sensitive animals without even having to know what the reasons for that difference in sensitivity is. And I think the, our ignorance of the effects, to my mind, makes that significantly more urgent. And I, just to close to say, I, I think you need to pay attention to more modern studies on North Atlantic codas. There have been, Antunis has a fantastic thesis on this. He did not find sympatric coda plans there. The coda repertoire varied as a function of geographical range. This is something more common in the Pacific, although Shane Jura has shown it for a very localized area around Dominica. I think I'll stop and have other people comment, but uh, Annabelle, I'd love to hear how many codas you've heard in your data set. Can, can Annabelle chime in? I don't know if we have the, I, I, I'd love for her to chime in too. Peter, just to answer your question I, I about the dose response stuff, I, I didn't, I did never saw it really as an either or kind of thing. I guess when I think about studies, feasibilities and whatnot, there are a lot of things that um, that that factor into the the feasibility of, of profiles and you know what what we put forward. And I guess part of it was was the cost and feasibility and things like that. And so so for me, I, I guess I wasn't I didn't think of it as an either or because because you know I have this sort of wall of post-it notes of of studies ideas and um, uh, uh, at the the dose response was was on there as well. But uh, no, but that's I'm, great. I'm bummed. Annabelle I think my main concern was I, I I'm questioning whether the existing data sets will work well. Almost all coda studies I'm aware of involve follows of staying near animals to record codas or acoustic recording tags on the animals. And I just like, there are several of those. Stephanie Watwood has published a paper with right. a bunch of uh, D tags out on animals in the OCS area off the uh, coast of the US. And those those clearly would be relevant for picking up codas. Uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, oh, Annabelle does not have a uh, working microphone. Uh, uh, Patrick, would you like to? Jump in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I see Annabelle answered with that they have heard some codas, but never done a targeted search. 
and only listen to sections occasionally. So that's fair enough. Automatic processing uh, is tricky to separate out, perhaps, if there's codas in there. And I guess I agree completely with what Peter said about detectability of codas versus regular clicks. Uh, I was just looking at a map of Norway where we attached uh, tags, GPS, and dive tags uh, to sperm whales there. And they do occasionally go on the shelf in Norway during certain seasons. And I think it's a priority to identify what animals might actually be using the shelf, if, if they are indeed using the shelf. And is could it be mother calf pairs or a more sensitive group? Something like that feels like a solid question. I, I think there's a lot of unknowns about quotas that weren't really represented fairly in your presentation, Jacob, which, I mean, I find it a fascinating question myself. I love these animals. You compared them to killer whales. They're actually very um, different in the yeah, sense that killer whales are well known to produce fixed repertoires. So a group of killer whales that's recorded multiple times over many years produces the same types of sounds. Yeah, that Whereas was just the sperm whales. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jacob. No, no, yeah. go ahead. I, I get excited. I didn't mean to jump off there, but okay. Yeah, yeah, it was, sure. It was an analogy in my head about the cultural differences, not. Yeah, um, I think it's important to be careful also because with humans, we have a very fixed idea of what culture means. And so it's easy for us to sort of impose our thoughts about it on what might be happening in the environment. And it's important to consider they aren't humans, of course, and something very different could be going on. And what's the certainty of our knowledge? I guess I would question. With killer whales, there's a lot of studies with photo identified groups in coastal areas that we can repeatedly see. And absolutely, they have very stable repertoires produced by family groups. With sperm whales, codas and patterns of sound production have been documented, but they, it, they're not exclusive sounds. Instead, they're the most common sound that's produced by a group of animals. And it could, in fact, be that they produce codas from other areas as well, but at a lower rate. So it's still entirely plausible that a given sperm whale might move from one area to another and encountering different animals might change the types of sounds or the proportion of sounds that it produces. And so we don't really have solid data uh, that an individual sperm whale has a fixed repertoire. And so by scoring clans, you're not necessarily scoring individual sperm whales. I think you have to be careful about assuming that. Um, and so it, there's a step there that I think is also quite speculative uh, that you want to be careful about before rolling this out on a, on a big scale. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah you, that you, kind you, of uncertainty was part of why I was focusing a little more on the effect study. It's clearly important to design an effect study to, to understand the most vulnerable parts and the most responsive parts of the population whatever the, the reason for that is. And it's particularly important for resident animals. So the study should be done in the area where the impact is going to be uh, uh, most intense. But I, I think that kind of study would, would resolve this question without having to involve a lot of the assumptions that um, Patrick was men that mentioning aren't particularly well supported by evidence. Yeah, I, I guess if I could just add on that a little bit that it seems you're basically subdividing and slicing up sperm whales and the possible effects on sperm whales, but we don't even really know what the effects on any sperm whales are. So it seems like you would start on a species level, maybe look at things like yeah, uh, calf's presence or things like that that are mandated and critical. And then maybe once you know something about responses, then consider how that might be important to differentiate and subdivide uh, which it can be relevant for some species. So the killer whales are an example. As you mentioned, it's strange. They just go right by a seal and won't eat a seal uh, when they're starving to death. So there are factors. I, I don't, I wouldn't say that the cultural idea is, is invalid. It's just that it, there's a lot of assumptions in there. In a way, it's a more nuanced question than the more, the critical thing is just are, is the species in general responsive to the types of activities that are regulated and um, are there known subgroups within the species that could have differences in how they use the habitat to be exposed more? And um, and mothers and calves are a good example of that. Yeah, I don't think that we even know that sperm whales go into the wind energy area in, in southern New England. What the Westell paper shows is that they're detectable by, by detectors on the fringes uh, of the area. So again, I think that the two things to my mind that are critical are how close do sperm whales get and what's the effect range? What's the kind of level at which the animals 
would respond. So the responses that we've measured to air guns showed pretty clear responses in terms of uh, decrement and foraging out to about 10 kilometers. Uh, but it may be that sperm whales don't get within 10 kilometers of the wind energy area. And I think so the, the, a better job at the localization, which uh, could be done quite easily, I think, by, by just increasing the, the capabilities of the kind of arrays that, that are in the Westell paper would be, to, to my mind, a critical next step, along with getting an estimate of the range, distance at which animals may be adversely affected. Uh, thank you very much. I'll, I'll turn to uh, to Dan, who said his hand raised and and wants to wants to jump in from from COSA. Yeah, I just thank uh, Peter and Patrick. I just wanted to follow up by saying to me, it's you have to have the largest. Peter already said this. The larger scale question is priority. Are the sperm whales even going on the shelf? It seems that they we we've always assumed they haven't. Now we're getting a little bit of information they might. It's critical to know how important that is, how how much of the population is actually doing that. The other right. question is management-wise, we're not at the level of, of even beginning to, we're having a hard enough time defining population and stocks. So while the clan idea is an interesting one, regulators aren't ready to even go there, nor have we even been able, we don't, I don't think, and Patrick and Peter can say whether we even have stock identity of sperm whales in the in the Atlantic. Uh, I know there's a different stock in the Gulf of Mexico versus the, the Atlantic. So these are much larger, more fundamental questions which have yet to be answered, yep. which to me is is where uh, the the effort should go. And I'll just say, I mean, I, I Peter said this as well. I think the clan question is exciting and interesting. It's a very nuanced uh, basic science question, but I. I, there's a lot of people that are even questioning whether how much how much selection operates at at the level of clans. Uh, these have to be fairly sophisticated, fairly reproductively isolated clans for that to actually happen. So it's a great it's an interesting study. Uh, I'd also say if you really wanted to study this, go where sperm whales are common and making a lot of noise, and you can actually go and get the kind of data that both Patrick and Peter were talking about. So thanks for for an interesting study and thanks for, for our guests. It, I, I really appreciate their input because I know a little bit and they know a heck of a lot more than I do. Yes, wonderful. Uh, and Jeremy, uh, you, you had a, a question or a comment? Yeah, just a more, more of a comment, uh, but I, and I, I really appreciate the the science behind it and, and the, the cultural aspect is interesting, but I'm not quite sure of the ultimate regulatory hook. So, uh, and it gets to some of the questions that uh, uh, Dan and Peter and Patrick have raised. So the, I mean, for the most part, MMPA regulates at the stock level. Uh, ESA, you can go down to the subspecies or discrete population segment, but uh, it, it might be difficult to regulate all the way down, um, and particularly in the, the existing environment, uh, to regulate down to the, the clan level. Thank you. I Someone gets to the question of Chevron deference yeah. and... Uh, <laughs> Some some of those other those other issues that are going to make it more difficult to sort of push the outer bounds of the envelope. I like the way you slid that in there. That's very good. Um, any other uh, questions or comments from from COSA or or no? I I I I'll tell you my ignorance on it. I didn't realize that you referred to sperm whale populations as stocks. I always think of them. A fishery is a fishery stock, which is something you're trying to harvest. But yeah, so it there stems I, from the whaling era when they were being harvested. Well, I I, I know there was a, a comment about slicing and dicing, and coming from New Bedford, that was the loaded one. I was gonna I was gonna breeze over that, but since you bring it up, uh, go ahead. Just I I was surprised when people were talking about the birds being killed by wind turbines as takings. So that comes from fisheries, but I don't think anyone was ever harvesting birds off of wind turbines. But well, we do talk about marine mammals being taken, and those takes can be just that they heard the sound and 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 change their behavior. So that's legal, legally it, defined. 
it, it's a, a legal term of art under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, the Endangered Species Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act. They all define taking different, but taking is broadly uh, used. And uh, that, that raises another, we have another uh, minute or so. So I, I mean, in, in dealing with the Endangered Species Act, when you're when you're talking about interactions, like, I, I know this from going through to try and get the the um, uh, uh, letters of authorization to do ex scientific experiments out in the wind farm areas. <clears throat> if you if you uh, you know for endangered species, if you if you affect their 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 spawning, their feeding, or their shelter, uh, you can be denied the ability to work on them. So. It, it, it seems like maybe that's the the way to kind of to to, to or, or or something to consider in looking at this as a as a focus because that's it's fairly hard to define uh, those and if you're doing that with sperm whales you know it's that's a big much bigger issue. Yeah, that's exactly the type of research Peter and Tayak and I worked on in the Gulf of Mexico was how certain sounds cause them to feed less. So indeed, uh, you, they, great animals, because they click when they feed, you can get a lot of information on, on that with sperm whales. It's actually relatively easy to study for that perspective among the whales. Great. Well, if there's nothing nothing further on that, thank you all. Thank you the, to our guests and, and to uh, 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 Jacob for a, a really interesting discussion. Uh, I hope those comments are of use to you, Jacob, and we'll we'll go on to our next uh, our next presentation, which is from uh, Melissa. Right. Morning. Hello. Or afternoon. Sorry. <laughs> um, should I share my presentation? Or are you guys gonna? Uh, whichever you prefer. Share it. Um, if you could share it, that would be great. So I can see hands raised. Oh, okay. I'm not going to be able to see hands. Okay, there we go. Okay. Um, my proposed study is for our very new carbon sequestration program on the OCS. Uh, this one is going to be looking at modeling the carbon, the potential um, carbon dioxide leakage from carbon sequestrations on uh, that we might be permitting on the OCS. So um, next slide, please. Just a little bit of background uh, for the context so that you understand the context. I'm not sure of the awareness of everyone in the room of of what carbon sequestration is and what our authority is and why we're doing this now. Um, so I'm just gonna briefly go over it. Um, so in 2021, the bipartisan infrastructure law amended the Our Implementing Act, which is the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act to authorize the secretary to allow for the granting of leases, easements and rights of way to support um, carbon dioxide streams being injected into the subseabed geologic formations on the OCS. We were also mandated in that law to develop regulations, which we are working on right now. Um, and so the context for this particular study is that it will not only help us in our ongoing rulemaking efforts, but it will also help in program um, development and implementation for various operational needs, such as our NEPA analyses, developing uh, lease planning strategies, lease stipulations, um, helping with understanding what's needed for our consultations, uh, planning and permitting approval, mitigation measures potentially, and also informing what we should expect in like risk assessment and monitoring requirements for these projects. So next slide. Um, again, I, I'm not sure how many how many folks understand the overall logistics of carbon sequestration. Um, it's where anthropogenic sources of carbon dioxide, such as from a power plant, a natural gas fire power plant, industrial sources like steel manufacturing, cement manufacturing, petrochemical manufacturing are captured before they are released to the atmosphere. It, it is 
then compressed into a supercritical fluid put into a pipeline or a ship. In this uh, picture here, we have it going through a pipeline um, and then it is transported to a storage site. For us, that storage site is of course on the OCS in the, uh, in the sub seabed. And you can see on this diagram various types of potential um, injection zones uh, or reservoir zones, such as a depleted oil and gas reservoir or uh, a deep saline reservoirs. Um, and typically the, the zones that we're aiming for are about 3,000 to 13 or 15,000 feet below the seabed. So these are going to be in fairly deep geologic formations. Um, the CO2 is injected through an injection well, and then it's monitored, um, and it is trapped by various mechanisms that can be macroscopic to microscopic. In other words, you can have geologic structures such as structural traps uh, where you have pinching out of geologic zones, or you can have uh, faults that act as seals or um, salt salt bodies that act as seals, similar to the oil and gas um, trapping mechanisms. Um, and then you have also microscopic mechanisms like capillary or residual trapping, or just the physics of the CO2 inside the pore space acts to sort of keep it in the pore space. You can also dissolve the CO2 into the groundwater, uh, that's um, dissolution trapping. And then you can also have remineralization where the CO2, which when it combines with water or forms carbonic acid and can dissolve certain types of minerals and remineralize into new minerals. Um, so that's really um, very stable trapping because it becomes a solid. Um, so we call that um, mineral trapping, mineralization trapping. So next slide. So this study will be addressing the potential environmental impacts from the leakage of CO2, if that happens um, in the coastal marine and human environment. And we're going to use the Gulf of Mexico as a state, as a case study, uh, but it will be applicable to all OCS regions. So this is a national study. Um, we're going to be modeling the CO2 leakage dynamics, how that CO2 might disperse its fate and transport and attenuation uh, across various conditions. So varying volumes and pressure scenarios, including worst case scenarios. So, and we want it to include infrastructure leakage as well as geologic types of leakage pathways. So anything from a pipeline rupture um, any kind of project well, for example, an injection well blowout uh, or, or leakage from a monitoring well or a pressure management well. Also legacy wells, which are wells that are pre-existing in the site. So um, any previous oil and gas well that might be plugged and abandoned or might be active or temporarily abandoned, all of those become potential leakage um, pathways as well as platform infrastructure and geologic pathways. So any natural geologic feature like a seep or a, a fault that might become reactivated or a fracture that might become activated. Uh, so any of those geologic pathways. Uh, next slide. Any questions so far? Or do we hold them till the end? <laughs> okay. Um, so this figure is the same figure, but it now it's showing the potential leakage pathways for CO2. So you can see where, for example, on the right side of the diagram, you could have CO2 from those reservoirs that uh, makes its way over to the fault. And maybe there's like improper pressure management going on with uh, the CO2 injection and it might reactivate that fault. It might cause some micro seismicity that reactivates that fault and now it's become a leakage pathway. Um, sim the same kind of um, interaction might, maybe the cement jobs are not good for, or they're worn out on these legacy wells that are really old. Um, maybe you have some improper sealing on, on your current existing project wells. So you might have leakage along those pathways. And then the little, you can see the little plumes there in the water column for 
representing pipeline leakage, um, a rupture, and then a well blowout from the active injection well. You can see it at the top there at the little derrick on top of the platform. There's a little blue cloud there to represent like a injection well blowout. Um, so go ahead, next slide. So some of the study objectives and methods, we're gonna start out with what's what are we dealing with right now? We, we, we need to understand the background uh, or the baseline of the current environment. So compiling as best we can information on background levels of CO2 in the marine environment that includes seasonal variations, cycles, you know, annual cycles, seasonal cycles, things like that. Um, cycles with the current, the physical oceanography, just trying to understand the best we can of like, what, what are we dealing with in terms of a baseline? And we'll have to probably look to other agencies like NOAA or NASA, who are already doing a lot of this CO2 um, monitoring um, in the ocean. Then we'll take existing leakage models and pilot tests. Um, there are a few that have been done in the offshore, the QUICS and RICS study have been done, um, not in the US, but overseas. And we can look at those um, leakage models and pilot tests. And also there's been one that's by Oldenburg that's been done in the Gulf of Mexico. And that's like, a, that's just a model. It's not an actual pilot test. We can look at some of these existing models to see how they may apply to uh, specifically the Gulf of Mexico OCS. Then we will we'll be modeling the leakage. Um, again, it's dispersion, bait, transport, how it attenuates under those various scenarios that I mentioned um, from the various leakage pathways. And then we'll try to examine how and model how that is impacting the chemical oceanography and how that might have an other environmental impacts. Um, and again, these will be feeding into our, our program implementation. Um, so that's, that's all I have. I know it's a quick overview, but hopefully there's lots of discussion and questions that I would love to hear from folks and participate in. Yes, Dan. Yeah, I got a, a couple of silly, simple questions. <laughs> okay. First, how hard or easy is it to capture the CO2 at the source? I mean, is that easy just to get this stuff so you can put it into the pipes? Um, well, there's been a lot of research on that. Um, we're, that's not our jurisdiction. I'll just start off with that. But um, yeah, it, it, there is definitely, if, if the question that you're asking is, is there a parasitic load or a energy cost to capture? Yes, that is correct. Um, but I think it is, you know, important that we try to stop these emissions. <laughs> no, I, I asked, it was really just out of fundamental curiosity. And and I think yeah. you, the, the other question I asked is, well, no, you answered before I asked it. it. And to me, it seems like as long as we're ahead of the game, that we're not producing more CO2 to capture it and stick it somewhere. Mm -hmm. That's like great because we got a serious problem. Yeah. And then the, the only, it's really a comment. Do you know, I mean, there are a number of places that I don't study, but I know people, Rini College studied natural CO2 seeps. There's one off mm -hmm. of, uh, I don't know if it's Corsica in Italy. It's one of the, it's either off Italy proper where there's natural volcanic activity and there is actual CO2 bubbling up out of the bottom. And there's some really interesting studies that have been done on how that ecosystem changes relative to the amount of CO2 in the water column. And it makes this a wonderful ecological experiment where you've got a natural gradient. And I've, I've seen images of the areas where the seeps are, and there's not a lot there. There are a few things living there. There's, I think it's heavy in algae, which, and, and, uh, which wouldn't be surprising, mm -hmm. but those would be, to me, seem like a really useful place to start where they have these natural seeps. Mm -hmm. You could start, I think a lot of the questions that you're raising, which are absolutely critical, you, you might get a long way if if we could study, if people pose these questions at these natural seeps. But otherwise, it sounds like, I mean, people get scared about this stuff, but I'm of the feeling that we got to do something. So I'm excited to see people thinking about this. Thanks. Yeah, there's been a lot of research uh, from 
decades old, decades and decades old from the oil and gas industry because they've been using CO2 onshore for enhanced oil recovery. So that's a lot of where the foundation of is this going to work has been coming from. But I, I totally agree. I think the natural seeps would be a really good added um, place for us to look to understand how the environment um, adjusts to seeping. Because really what they're studying with the oil and gas EOR scenario is it's it's it tends to stay underground. CO2 likes to stay down there. It's like putting mayonnaise on bread was the analogy that I've heard, which I love that because it just sort of sticks, you know, you can't get all the mayonnaise off if you try to get it off. So with EOR recovery, they never get all that CO2 back. There is always incidental storage with CO2 EOR, even when they try to recover it. Um, so a lot of the, the corollaries that we've been using right now are from the decades of that, uh, those activities going on. But I think that's a great addition to where we can, where we can look to see how the environment is adjusting to a CO2 seat. That's, that's, that's a good point. Thank you. I'll, I'll, try, I'll try and see if I can dig up some of those studies and put them in the. In the yeah, room. that would be really helpful. That would be great. <laughs> and I, I, yeah, I'm going to uh, jump on and let our invited uh, guests, uh, 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 Stephen Davis, but uh, if he would like to ask some questions or comment or perhaps have Ooh. some mayonnaise on a sandwich or something. <laughs> Well, I don't have mayonnaise, but I actually <laughs> have comments and questions. Okay. Um, one is, this is a really broad proposal. There's yeah. all kinds of stuff, including, it seemed like, uh, almost software or analysis technique development. Um, so it seems seems very broad. And I, I'm curious about how you feel like you can accomplish these all this huge suite of goals cover all kinds of stuff actually um, yeah within the project we did narrow it down to um, one region and one case study where i was hoping that that would be enough to hopefully okay uh, narrow it down enough but i'm if jen is on the phone she's one of our modelers who might be able to address the modeling aspect. She's my co-author on this on this study. I'm more of the geologist CO2 expert and she's the modeling expert. Right. Yeah, uh, uh, to be honest, I'm not uh, the modeling expert. I model other things, but except CO2, I model some <laughs> oil spill. You know, that, that is a good question because oil is a, a spill is a occurring organically you know oil seep people get lots of information from natural oil seep yeah. um oil spill is much more complicated i think it's a little bit more complicated but it dep depends on how you study because co2 is everywhere so it's hard to tell so i, I know because i work with melissa on this profile he, he he she covers uh, lots of ground <laughs> because i'm a modeler i know what can model what cannot so yeah. basically, I'm thinking, um, from my perspective, we probably should just aim for a um, for worst case scenario, you know, as the first step. Because yeah. you have to see at <clears throat> what uh, what the level of CO2, um, just like oil spill, <laughs> you know, at what level they can make substantial uh, environmental impact. Because I read some papers, definitely they say that, um, yeah, especially the paper, I think it's decades old, um, Blackford, you know, the paper has not seen, they did lots of uh, field tests and also versus the models. What their conclusion is that um, it, it's hard, you know, for small small amount of CO2, it's hard to detect the impact over long period of time duration. So, so that's what I, I'm thinking, we cannot uh, have like, one thing you can solve this profile are going to solve every questions that you know regulatory you know are going to set us our policies because Melissa covers lots of ground you know like NEPA stuff because yeah. people doing NEPA are different set of people who's doing modeling so you cannot ask the one group you know mm -hmm. to do this model stuff then answer your NEPA question so that's what I'm thinking we should just uh, um, I agree uh, with first, that yeah I, mean, I agree with that like I mean I don't think a, a a seep that's like just bubbles yeah, is so... really going to from a geologic like a fault or something like that is really going to have enough 
impact for us to potentially even measure. I mean, this is some of the stuff that mm -hmm. is not only going on in this community for CO2, but it's also going on in like the marine carbon dioxide removal community. They're trying to figure out how, how do they even assess whether or not this marine carbon dioxide removal technologies are doing anything because how do they measure it when CO2 is everywhere? CO2 yeah. is everywhere. So, okay, so um, um, I agree that something that's like worst case, a pipeline rupture or a well blowout okay. would be probably the most important things for us to model because those are where we would really, I agree with Jen that we would, that where there might be uh, significant imp environmental impacts. And yeah. so, yeah, I agree with that constraining of this study. Sure. That's good because <laughs> that actually yeah. was one of my comments was geologic leakage that is going to be a trickle. I mean, it's just going to be bubbles if it happens at all, which is low probability. Um, but I do have a comment about generalizing a GOM OCS um, study to all of our shelf OCS areas. And that is the GOM is completely unique relative to every other OCS area in the North America. Um, Part of exactly. The uh, and because that is, people, and, it, and yeah. that is because it has salt and the salt is extremely mobile, is currently mobile um, and creates all kinds of non-predictable um, impacts. Everything from temperature and stress regimes that vary wildly across the OCS and with proximity to salt bodies to um, uh, the fault behavior, which is it's not seismic, which would be very different from, say, offshore um, west Western North America. And so I the study might be really applicable to um, Nova Scotia offshore, um, where there is also very active salt tectonics, or West Africa, um, but not necessarily the Atlantic offshore or the Pacific offshore or Alaska offshore. And so I guess for me, I don't see how you can, you know, you'll get useful information from this, mm -hmm. but um, from a geologic viewpoint anyway, it's, it's its own thing and stands out all by itself. That may not matter, um, but I'm just kind of um, want to throw that out there. That, that at least from a sort of reservoir leakage and containment kind of study, um, I don't, I'm not sure this is a great analog for anything else um, except different environments around the globe, really. I, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, and one thing that's really different in the Gulf of Mexico is the water temperature, which is extremely warm. Um, will never match anything in the Pacific. And so that impacts CO2 solubility and and how you um, um, absorb or don't absorb CO2 that's emitted at the water bottom. Um, so that, that was- I think of... what I was thinking there is, you know, and again, I'm not a model, <laughs> but um, I was thinking that the methodology that we use could translate to other regions when it's time to look at those regions. Mm -hmm. Like we take this as sort of like a case study and then we look at, take that process and apply it to other, to the other regions when they're, when it's time to look at those. Mm -hmm. I, I think I was looking at more from like the 30,000 foot level when I said that it could apply to other OCS okay. regions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that wasn't that. That's a yeah. that really. Valid. I'll have to be more yeah, clear it, about it that. It wasn't clear at all in the in the proposal. That, which okay. Is what I was like, this I'll be more clear. <laughs> analog for anywhere else in the. No, US that's not what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I took it. Sorry. Um, that's okay. I need to be more clear. That's good. Yeah. You know, criticism. So <clears throat> the other bits of this um, kind of relate to the discussion about the modeling. Um, I think, first of all, I'm not sure what you mean by a well blowout, but no one's going to drill. First of all, we're not going to drill as deep as, say, Macondo. No. 
way too expensive and they will I mean it is a worst case scenario which it, is highly is. unlikely but the no. the issue is uh, a well blowout it's extremely low probability and I think yeah one very. thing you mm -hmm. do before you start is try to come to some understanding of the odds that uh, you know what's the chance of a of a catastrophic geologically basically zero um of a well bore blowout that's also extremely low because you're not going to cite a CCS project where you're at near lithostatic um, fluid pressures um, because you won't be able to inject anything without <laughs> fracturing the reservoir and destroying the seal. Um, so, you know, the, the types of things that cause well bore blowouts are going to be almost non existent or a very low chance of happening. What's yeah, more likely, is, especially in the Gulf of Mexico, and it might be a good place to study this, is you're going to encounter wells that penetrate reservoirs. They may not you know, be completed in the reservoir, but they may be going deeper. Um, and so leakage up the annulus of, or even up the old well tubing possibly, um, might be something you can think about, but it's not going to be a blowout. It's not going to be catastrophic. This would be more of a pressure management issue because we are yeah. dealing with high pressure CO2. Uh, this would be more it's, an issue of probably more of an issue of pressure management. Yeah, most um, most CO2 is going to be injected, you know, as you said, supercritical, but yeah. it'll be in, it has to be injected, you know, at a slightly higher pressure than the reservoir. But in general, uh, most design and projects that I've been associated with are looking at le 100 or less PSI above reservoir pressure um, because they are trying to manage the reservoir pressure during injection. Yes. And, um, and so, you know, it's unlikely that anyone's going to cite something that has um, existing reservoir pressures that are so high um, <laughs> that you're going to have to be injecting at some extreme pressure. Um, as they're going to be looking at things near hydrostatic or normal pressure type reservoirs or maybe just slightly elevated. Well, it'll have to be over the pressure of lithostatic for sure. Um, and because it will have to be able to be pushed into the reservoir and plus the, super, the CO2 no. is at a higher pressure, but it's not going to be, we can't inject it at such a pressure that it's going to fracture the reservoir or fracture the seal. So you have to, and also the pressure builds up as you continue to inject CO2. So, you know. Yes, it does, but <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I've, um, so you can't do it at greater than lithostatic because then you fracture the whole every system and it all disappears. Um, but um, so so the difference it's fluid pressure versus rock pressure or lithostatic, which is the whole load. Um, the in terms of pressure dissipation, yeah, that's going to be a concern if you have really limited aquifers or you know, um, confined reservoirs that are fairly small, then you could definitely reach very high pressures. And that happened offshore Norway in right. Schnobit, right? That was yes, sort of yes, our correct. classic example and um, that. But, you know, what I'm, and you can certainly look at that as a end member scenario, but the most likely scenario is that you're going to have an extensive aquifer in that, um, the actual reservoir pressure build is going to be relatively small. And if you manage it, it's an engineering management problem um, more than anything. The reservoir engineers have to sort of make a decision about uh, injection rates and acceptable pressures. Um, so, yeah, maybe you could do a wellbore blowout, but I think that would be in a really extreme scenario. I think. Um, uh, well head apparatus and pipeline blowouts are a lot more likely if you're going to have, you know, want to do a real high flux um, type of uh, model.
Right. I, I'm just, I don't, you know, maybe, I mean, you could do a wellbore blowout, but I think that would be a low probability. And so you might concentrate more on the infrastructure blowout problem, which seems. Well, the blowout would happen at the platform. Right. Um, and why? I guess my question is, why would there be a blowout at the platform? I, I, I've only it seen go one. Up the pipe. Yeah. Um, but what's, <laughs> I guess my question is, what's going to make it come up the pipe? I, I know it's under pressure and the pressure is, you know, greater than earth surface. So yes, but you're, injection design is going to be designed to avoid exactly that circumstance. And so, and you would never try to inject into a reservoir at such high pressure that that's a probability. It, you know, you can do it if, if, but I can't believe such a thing would ever be permitted. I'm, I'm going to just ju jump on here to make sure that, because we do have a second guest on, on, but I don't know that they've shown up. It, t it, is is Tip uh, um, McHale on? Is yeah. he on there? Anyway, nope. nope, nope, no Tip. Okay, no. okay. Um, yeah. We do have a couple of questions from the committee as well. Uh, uh, Catherine, or sorry, I'm sorry, uh, Karen. Actually, yeah. it's it's not really a question. It's just a note that in your in your um, study idea, you wrote that most of the CO two data has been collected by NOAA. And I suggest you look to the UNALS fleet because a lot of the ships now are equipped with PCO2 and pH sensors that they run continuously. And they put a lot of that data up on the rolling deck to repository database, as well as potentially there being other CO2 data that's been collected by PIs and stuff. So I mean, the ships, it's it's underway data that they're collecting all the time. So that's a great opportunity to get more information. Thanks. Um, um, I just, you know, like I have a question. Um, for Steve, so you said that we shouldn't do this worst case scenario because it's very low probability. So I just wonder, maybe we can do some of the runs like um, um, testing, you know, at what level of leakage is going to make significant impact at like pH, pH level. Yeah. Test a few scenarios, you know, then we can draw the line, you know. So I think that's probably a better approach. Yeah, I think that's a that would be a great way to start because mm -hmm. it would probably eliminate a whole bunch of um, modeling that wouldn't necessarily mm -hmm. be very relevant. Mm -hmm. So just do sort of a generic set of tests of models, um, and and that brings me to um, you know that's sort of in line with one of my other comments, which is how do you what are your flux rates? You know, you're going to have have to assume different CO2 flux rates for your different types of leaks. And mm -hmm. how do you quantify that? What basis do you have um, to establish your flux rates that you're going to use in your models? Because this is very new. Because like oil spill, for example, like you said, we have some statistics. Like we have oil spill occurrence rate based on historic records. And we use some of statistics method to extrapolate, you know, based on the volume, volume production volume, you know, I know that very well. Then you talk about low probability, but for this, I don't know if they have a literature on some other countries, they have some leaks from this, you know, their sequestration effort. We can get some statistic on that, then trying to maybe apply some fault tree or some other statistic method to extrapolate to see, you know, what's the likelihood Given the mm -hmm. Gulf of Mexico uh, environment, like hurricane or other cause factors, to see what's the likelihood of these worst case scenarios. Because I, I don't know a lot about this CO two stuff because I read some of the papers, but I haven't worked on that. But but I uh, I didn't know the PCO two measurement like power station in Pacific West, and we are also a sponsor of you know in the past five years, so <clears throat> they do have a database you know on PCO two data. They have a ship track, you know, going back and forth, the, the sensors mounted on the ship, so you know the PCO2, but I don't know who has mapped out the, the <laughs> P, uh, mapped out the Gulf of Mexico, like uh, PC, yeah. uh, pH levels, alkalinity. So I yeah. don't know. Yeah. 
because we need yeah. a lot of background information as well. It's um, there is not a lot of information on on uh, natural CO two leaks. <clears throat> um, there are some, and in general, the fluxes for natural leaks, um, and these are all onshore. They're not offshore. Mm -hmm. Um, that are relevant to this question, um, you know, the volcanic gas uh, expulsion that I think uh, Dan brought up. Um, that's really interesting, but it's a completely different system. I mean, it's just almost, it's not really comparable. Um, the rocks are different, the source is different, and, uh, you know, there's, it's very different. Um, it may give you information about the ecosystem and how it's impacted, but it's not really gonna impact this modeling, I don't think. Um, the natural fluxes I've seen are quite low um, and um, that part. I don't, I don't know that figures are minuscule. Um, there's studies, there's a study from uh, the St. John's uh, carbon dioxide accumulation in Northeast Arizona. They estimated some fluxes. There's been various estimates with, in Utah, at the Little Grand Wash Fault and nearby faults um, about uh, CO2 fluxes, but they're pretty small. Um, and I guess what you would have to do for something like a pipeline blowout or wellhead blowout or something um, is get into some of the engine you'd have to estimate it based on engineering data um, so what's the pressure co2 pressure in the pipeline how big is the, the hole in the pipe or whatever and what would your flux out of that be um, i can't think of many other ways to get that answer because we don't really we don't have very much um many examples to pick from at this point. You know, this is a pretty small sample set um, as it stands right now. You know, Sleipner's not leaking, um, Schnovitz not leaking. Uh, what other projects? Uh, Otway in Australia, that's onshore. That one might be an interesting one to look at because I think they have tried to create leaks, but those are ge geologic leaks mostly. Yeah, it's a pretty tiny sample set. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, you're going to have to figure out how to estimate the flux before you can model it, I guess. And then I think um, the idea of, of just doing generic models to sort of see Where's the threshold where it really starts to matter? Yeah. Will help narrow the range what you might try. Right, based on these unique physical oceanographic conditions, because yeah. each region has very unique physical oceanographic conditions. You cannot, you have to have a separate hydrodynamic model. Absolutely. To drive this thing, yeah. Yeah, and chemical models, you know. Chemical models, yeah, chemical models. You know, also depends on, has to be site specific. So what I would say after all this, though, it, a word of encouragement is it'd be really great to have more than just Oldenburg and Pan <laughs> and that, the other study, the uh, Netherlands exactly. study. That is a very idealized study. <laughs> oh, it's totally theoretical. You know, they just, yeah. Um, yeah. but it'd be nice to have something a lot more solid and mm -hmm. um, with some more, um, yeah, more based on more real information. Agree. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank thanks, Steve, for, for your comments. Thank you for the presentation, Melissa, and, and, and the work. I, I, I hope that the uh, I hope that the, it's giving you some ideas and thoughts to move forward with your proposal. We're gonna we're gonna take a 15 minute break here and let everyone stretch and then we'll start up again at uh, 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 what is it the time? Two two forty five. So Thank you very much. I know I need a I need a gong or something like that. A buzzer. Who's present? Is it Holly? Is it presenting? I think. I think.
Yeah. yeah. Okay, if we if we could get back at it, please. And uh, uh, Yoko, I just want to make sure that the, the next presenter is it Holly? Yes, Holly. Uh, she's and I am here. Yeah. Can you see me? Yep, we're all set, Holly. We can see you. Uh, did you? You guys, um, are you guys going to put it? You want us to put your slides up for you? Um, can you see my slides? Uh, no, we can't. Oh, oh geez. Can you see them now? Yes. Great. I'll go ahead and get started. Is everybody ready? We we are we are ready to go. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me today, this afternoon. Uh, my name is Holly Weck. I am a physical scientist in the Office of Environmental Programs. I specialize in air quality. Um, I'm also excited to um, say that I have two NOAA guests with me today to help me present this um, profile, uh, Brian McDonald and Steve Brown. And I appreciate their efforts helping me with this uh, presentation and this profile. Oops, it jumped slides. There we go. So um, a little background on the study. Um, the study is titled uh, Evaluation of OCS AQS and Development of a Satellite-Based Top-Down Emissions Inversion System. First off, this is an evaluation of the tool. BOEM has developed a tool for air quality management called OCS AQS. And one of the modules in the tool is an emission inventory. So this is an evaluation of the emissions inventory in the tool. Um, but we also have a modeling um, module and some other um, in the works um, development. Um, it doesn't, like I said, the study itself isn't evaluating the tool itself for air quality management, it's, it's uh, evaluating the emission inventory that's in the tool. Background, um, so previous studies have highlighted uncertainties. I don't know why, I'm sorry, it's jumping around on me. It's very sensitive. <laughs> um, previous studies have highlighted uncertainties in Bohm's Outer Continental Shelf Air Quality System. Um, for the Gulf of Mexico region. And there's a there's one of the authors and the date of the article. Um, basically, Carbon Mapper has flown offshore and shown that there are high emissions, methane emissions in shallow water facilities that don't look to be captured in our emission inventory um, in OCS AQS. Um, in addition, uh, we've also seen where um, other authors have suggested that our NO2 emissions are overestimated in our inventory. So um, these are some interesting things we need to like dive into. Um, our emissions inventory, first off for background, um, is a bottom-up inventory. And what that means is the operators supply us with activity data. And we then use EPA emission factors and EPA calculation methods and we calculate the inventory. So these are not measured data. This is all estimates um, based on operator input. So um, we don't have any monitors offshore. So one of the things BOEM is looking into is using satellite data, since this is like all new. Um, NASA recently launched temp the Tempo satellite, which gives us hourly uh, NO2 uh, concentrations offshore in the Gulf of Mexico region. Um, so the other thing that, that BOEM is doing is we've been working with NASA, um, on a scope cruise. And what that is, is, uh, measurements offshore in the Gulf of Mexico region for, um, NO2 and methane as well. We just conducted scope two cruise in the Gulf, um, in the beginning of June. And we had a lot of methane that we, we saw coming from offshore oil and gas facilities. Um, so we try to funnel all this into our bottom up emission inventory, but there's also this top down approach for emission inventory development. And that would be using um, airborne surveys, satellite data, 
Um, and we're wondering if we can evaluate our inventory on a basin-wide scale using all of the satellite data in these airborne surveys and then quantify the uh, uncertainties that we have with our inventory. Um, however, like the slide says, these campaigns are costly to be repeated. Um, the NASA study, they were offshore for 12 days and it cost uh, about $1.5 million. Uh, and that's for the analysis and everything too, not just the data, not just the capturing of the data, but that's also for, like I said, the analysis as well and the, and a final report. Um, high resolution satellite technologies offer a more practical mean of continuous long-term monitoring of air pollutants in comparison to those airborne surveys. So can, can we use the satellite to derive emission, a regional emission fluxes through techniques such as inverse modeling? And that's that's the question that we have. Um, so NOAA is on the call and helping me present today because this would be an interagency agreement with NOAA. And NOAA already has a, a plan called Air Maps where they're going to conduct airborne campaigns in 2024 through 2026. And they can possibly extend it into the Gulf of Mexico region, which would be this study. Um, AirMap supports the 2023 White House nation national strategy to advance an integrated greenhouse gas measurement, monitoring, and information system, um, demonstrating the use and value of a tiered integrated satellite, airborne, and ground-based observing system. So what we're trying to do is um, we have, like I said, the bottom-up inventory. We have this measured airborne data and this measured satellite data. Can we somehow do inverse modeling and like figure out if we could use satellite data in the future to help us improve our inventories? So why does why is Bohm so cu uh, curious to up to update and improve their inventories? Um, it's because Bohm uses our air quality emissions inventories for um, impacts assessments for NEPA, and we also have um, regulatory authority. Um, under the Outer, Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act in the Gulf of Mexico region for criteria pollutants, which is a, VOC is a, is a precursor to ozone. So VOC is considered um, one of those one of those pollutants that we do regulate and look at. Um, and the reason I'm bringing VOC up is because methane is a VOC. Um, so this study supports BOEM's ability to monitor, monitor air emissions over the OCS improved qualification approaches. Um, these pictures that I've produced here, um, this is our tool, like I said, our air quality management tool that's been developed where operators can log in and type in their activity data and it'll calculate in an inventory. They can also do modeling. Um, there's five years of MET data in there. They can use CalPUF or AirMod, um, EPA, AirMod um, modeling. Um, and um, it produces maps too. Now, this isn't a modeled map. This is just an emissions map of um, draft NO2 data for 2023. So our study's objective is to conduct a comprehensive aircraft campaign to measure multiple air pollutant concentrations in 2026 to estimate basin-wide top-down emission fluxes from the Gulf of Mexico oil and gas activities. NOAA hasn't exactly said what in-kind contributions they will be, but there'll probably be some. Um, so this is a good thing to work with NOAA. And like I said, they're already planning a campaign for the whole U.S. So, um, you know, if the Gulf of Mexico could be included, that would be great. Um, and then we're going to compare our BOEM OCS AQS bottom-up inventory to the top-down atmospheric measurement-based estimates of basin-wide emission fluxes to assess its accuracy and then develop an inverse modeling system to derive basin-wide emission flux estimates of selected air pollutants from satellite data. Um, and on the right, like I said, we did do the scope crews um, in June. The top is showing some flaring we saw from one facility in particular, almost the whole two weeks we were offshore. And the bottom is showing, we did um, aircraft campaigns with NASA um, with the uh, carbon mapper instrument, which is the AVS-3. And we did capture some methane um, from facilities as well. 
and I'm going to let Noah go through. I, I've advanced a slide. It's just hesitant. I'm going to let Noah go through the methodology with you. Okay. Thanks, Holly. I'll get started. Uh, my name is Steve Brown. I uh, am at the NOAA Chemical Sciences Laboratory in Boulder, uh, and we are uh, spearheading this uh, multi-year effort called Air Maps that Holly has uh, already uh, introduced to you. So in particular, the, um, the thing that we are going to bring to this whole question of top-down emissions for, uh, for the next few years uh, are two aircraft. So um, the NOAA P3, you can see that in our in the kind of lower right graph there in the, uh, under methods. Um, that's a heavy lift aircraft that is instrumented with a really wide variety of different kinds of um, chemical species. Uh, and I'll get into the utility of, of what that provides to us, but it's very, very comprehensive chemical payload that gives us a very detailed look at atmospheric composition. Uh, in addition to giving us a very detailed look at meteorology and radiation and the like. And I will um, elaborate on that just a little bit more as I go along here. Uh, the other aircraft is a little harder to see in that lower graph. Uh, it's over on the uh, kind of left side of that lower graph. It's a smaller aircraft. That's the NOAA Twin Otter. Um, that does not have as much chemical detail because it's a much smaller airplane, but it's also a uh, relatively versatile aircraft, one that we can get um, a larger number of flight hours on. And so... Uh, with these two different aircraft working together at different scales, we hope to be able to provide um, new and accurate top-down emissions estimates for a variety of uh, regions and sectors, uh, including potentially the Gulf of Mexico. Um, air maps as a whole, I should say the logo is up there in the right upper right-hand corner. Uh, and as, as Holly's already said, that stands for the Airborne and Remote Sensing Methane and Air Pollutant Survey. And so we are really looking to tie together these assets that we are going to bring, these airborne assets that we are gonna bring, which primarily measure in the lower atmosphere within the mixed layer where the sources are, um, together with uh, all these different kinds of other measurement technologies. So uh, we, we anticipate doing coordinated measurements with uh, higher altitude research aircraft that have um, imaging spectrometers on them that mimic the way that the, uh, the satellites will see the surface and, and be able to derive spectroscopically derive uh, uh, things like NO2 and formaldehyde and methane and CO2 and some other species. Um, and then, of course, also the, uh, the spaceborne instruments that um, are in different types of orbits and may uh, measure uh, these kinds, these same things at, at different temporal scales. Um, so, uh, and then of course, those are all integrated together with, uh, with the surface level measurements, the way you saw in that, that graphic on the front end slide. Um, so uh, the, the actual, when we get to the actual methodology for those two aircraft, um, that's what that lower right graphic um, represents. So kind of our primary approach here is a, is a very well-known technique that's called mass balance. Uh, you know, it's fairly simple in its, in its concept in that you, try to fly upwind and downwind of a particular source region that you're interested in. That could be at any number of scales all the way from the facility scale to the basin scale. Here, we're mostly talking about basin scale kinds of measurements. Uh, and then if you have a very good measurement of the downwind enhancement of a particular pollutant, as well as a good understanding of the wind field between those upwind and downwind legs, you can turn that, in, that, uh, that set of measurements into a flux. Um, and so that's a that's a method of getting at uh, getting at a horizontal flux. One of the things that we bring to this study that we think is very exciting and new is that um, we're we're doing a very good job measuring that transport piece. So we have uh, uh, airborne Doppler lidar systems on both of our aircraft that measure the uh, the boundary layer depth as well as the complete wind field above and below the aircraft in flight. So we get not just the the flight level winds, but um, really a full picture of how the transport is occurring throughout the boundary layer as we fly. Um, th then, you know, because we have the chemical detail more so on the P3, a little less so on the Twin Otter, um, we can then do, uh, we can look at emissions both from the point of view of just correlating pollutants with each other, so we can relate unknown pollutants to known pollutant emissions inventories, but more to the point, we can do source attribution really well that way. So. We can tell the difference between different kinds of sources. So for example, if we're sa sampling over land, uh, those kinds of chemical tracer relationships can tell us the difference between agricultural methane and oil and gas methane as an example. 
Um, when we're out in the Gulf, uh, we would mainly be looking, I think, at, a, at an oil and gas source, but we would, um, for, for methane, but we would, you know, be looking at other sources as well for other kinds of pollutants, including things like shipping. Um, and then uh, eddy covariance is another uh, uh, common method that's used, a little less uh, uh, commonly used from aircraft. In that case, rather than measuring the horizontal flux, uh, you measure the vertical flux. So as you fly through the, the boundary layer, you look at the variation of different pollutants with the vertical wind speed. And again, that just requires that you have uh, good, accurate, fast response measurements of chemical composition, coupled to good, accurate, fast response measurements of vertical winds to be able to do that. And Brian McDonald, who will follow me, will talk about uh, the, the last method here, which is, which is the inverse modeling piece. Um, and then the last thing, to, the cu last couple of points here, just highlight that um, we'd be trying to do this, uh, you know, really look at, evaluate all the different top town methods, tie them together with these, uh, these different approaches that we can bring from the, uh, from the aircraft, and then make those comparisons, as Holly said, uh, to those, to the bottom up kinds of estimates uh, that are, that underlie this, uh, this tool that Bohm has. Uh, uh, we would like to be able to do this in 2026. We are aiming for something like 35 to 40 hours and uh, something like five-ish, five, uh, five -ish, maybe, you know, give or take a few uh, flights on the, the P3. Um, we think any given flight, which is of, of order seven to eight hours in duration, can cover a decent chunk of the Gulf of Mexico, maybe a third to a half on a single flight. And so we would try to do the whole basin, but break it down into a series of grids or sub basins to try to accomplish that with the P3 with enough repeats to be able to understand um, what we're doing statistically with multiple sampling of at least some of those regions. Uh, the Twin Otter is a much lower, much lower range aircraft. So that was really the kind of thing that we would apply more to facility scale measurements uh, where we would just look at individual platforms or groups of platforms and try to get some sense um, for what emissions look like on, on that spatial scale with the, with the Twin Otter. And in that case, we, we might be looking at something on the order of 50 uh, flight hours dedicated to that activity with the Twin Otter. Um, so that's most of what I have to say about methods. I can turn it over to Brian who can talk uh, about uh, modeling. Yep, so I'm Brian McDonald. I'm uh, also at the NOAA Chemical Sciences Laboratory in Boulder, and I am the program leader of the Atmosphere Composition Modeling Group. So we work very closely with Steve's groups doing the, the uh, experimental observation side of things. Um, so uh, on that second bullet point there, you see uh, the satellite-based emissions inversions using the greenhouse gas and air pollutant emission system, or GRAPES. So you can think of GRAPES as the complement modeling activity to this uh, uh, NOAA Airborne Field Campaign Air Maps. Uh, GRAPES is a, a joint initiative across multiple federal agencies being led by uh, NIST and NOAA and is an uh, activity under the uh, U.S. Greenhouse Gas Measurement and Monitoring Information System being led by uh, OSTP and OMB. Uh, so what's the idea here is to uh, both look at bottom up, do the top down in, uh, emissions inversion work to assess the uncertainties in bottom up inventories for both uh, greenhouse gases and, and air pollutants. So there's a variety of approaches we can use. Uh, so there are uh, one example is on the right, it shows an example of Lagrangian back trajectory modeling. So you take the observations of the aircraft use the wind fields to get a better sense of where the sources are, and then you can optimize the sources to match the concentrations of what the aircraft sees. Um, you know, the other approach, and this is the approach that's needed to really bring in satellite data into uh, emission inversion systems is using Eulerian chemical transport models. Uh, and so here you are able to bring in uh, satellite data sets, aircraft data sets, and ground-based, if there were ground-based or ship-based data sets uh, using an, uh, 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 statistical techniques or ensemble common filter approaches to optimize the emissions to match the variety of uh, observations you may have, whether they're in situ observations or column observations observed from, from space. Um, and so from space, you know, as Holly mentioned, you know, we can't do aircraft campaigns all the time, whereas uh, satellites are there 
all the time, although, you know, they they have to see cloud uh, free conditions to be able to see down to the, the surface, but they are there and uh, potentially a data set to be able to do more routine type of monitoring of emissions. And so uh, Holly mentioned one satellite, Tempo, but there's also a series of polar orbiting satellites that measure in the UV visible spectrum. So these would get nitrogen dioxide, which could be used to constrain uh, NOx emissions, uh, formaldehyde, which could be used to constrain non-methane volatile organic compound emissions. Uh, and um, and then a the whole constellation of greenhouse gas satellites. So some of these greenhouse gas satellites, many of these greenhouse gas satellites tried to target individual facilities. And then there's also greenhouse gas satellites that get more kind of that basin level type of estimate, uh, in particular for methane. So in this work, we would be trying to look at all three species to get a better uh, uh, bring them into an emissions inversion system using chemical data assimilation approaches um, and, and evaluating the, um, uh, the BOEM inventory, the OCS AQS inventory, uh, and then also the aircraft observations with inverse modeling on the aircraft observations give us also an independent check of, of um, doing the emissions inversion on satellite data alone. Um, the second bullet point here refers to the, the NASA BOEM scope cruises. So the one thing to note about uh, me measuring species, trace gas species offshore is it can be a difficult environment, right? So the dark surface makes it harder to detect nitrogen dioxide and formaldehyde from space. Uh, and for greenhouse gases like methane, you have to observe in a sunglint mode to be able to, to see methane. And so these cruises are going to be really important for evaluating the fidelity of the satellite retrieval um, um, before you can use it in an emissions aversion system. So uh, I think we're planning to work with NASA and BOA. We've talked with NASA also to be able to work with the scope cruise data to evaluate the fidelity of the satellite data. That's kind of step one. And then once that fidelity is there, bringing it into a, a full-on emissions inversion um, system. And then the last thing I'll just mention is that uh, for emissions inversion, atmospheric transport, the uncertainties associated with meteorology are really uh, uh, critical for getting a good emissions inversion. And so uh, as part of this, we do plan to evaluate with meteorological observations, including a Doppler LiDAR system on the aircraft during the air, air maps campaign. So this will help us with vertically resolved winds and planetary boundary layer heights. Um, and lastly, we can also assimilate that meteorology as well. Um, so just to end here, you know, we're trying to throw all the, the uh, uh, methods that we can use to get top-down emissions for both greenhouse gas and air pollutants. These include model independent methods that Steve Brown talked about. It also includes, you know, bringing in models uh, for those inversion techniques and and ultimately quantifying the uncertainties or potential biases, errors, uh, and, and an emissions inventory. Um, and, uh, and really, I think the, the uh, other th the main thing we'll be looking here is, is can satellite data be used in the future uh, if you don't have these aircraft observations? Do they give you similar estimates as, say, maybe more our traditional approaches for, for estimating emissions uh, offshore? And uh, and this is important to support a lot of the, the BOEM goals that are kind of listed here. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for, for presenting your uh, work. We do have a guest uh, uh, invited expert to, uh, so I'll ask if, uh, if Gary uh, Yarwood would like to uh, to comment on the proposal before we take a few uh, comments from the committee. Uh, yeah, let me check whether you can hear me okay. Yeah, we'll give me a thumbs up. Very good. And, and let me just briefly introduce myself since you, most of you probably don't know me. My name is Greg Yarwood. I'm an atmospheric chemist. My professional work is helping government agencies with air quality planning for difficult things like ozone and fine particulate matter. And 
That means we've worked a lot with emission inventories and air quality measurements and satellite data and aircraft flights, uh, trying to put all of this together in photochemical models. And uh, we've done a lot of work with the state of Texas who have, they've been very active over a couple of decades. And I have to say that big step forward, steps forward and understanding air quality in Texas have come from NOAA P3 aircraft flights. You know, those have really been transformative uh, because of the, the range of instrumentation on that aircraft. It just gives you a very complete picture of what's going on. So, uh, you know, I think just right there, this is a very exciting study, the potential for aircraft flights to make a difference. And it's even more, understanding air quality over the Gulf is even more of a challenge because you don't have routine surface observations. You know, it's a, it's a data black hole. So um, I think it's critical to look to the future and satellites and bringing aircraft data can uh, help you connect the, the satellites to um, known data sources. So, you know, I'm very excited about the study. Um, I do have some questions. Uh, um, Greg, we thought you were going to stop there. Yeah. Um, understanding vertical structure, I think, is is important. And I mean, I know you talked about this, but I'd just like to ask a little more. Um, the None of the existing air quality models do well over the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and, you know, perhaps it's emissions, uh, perhaps it's chemistry, but I, you know, perhaps it's understanding the depth of the boundary layer as well and how those emissions mix vertically. So I wonder to what extent your flight planning, and I, I mean, I noted you're only planning five P3 flights about. So maybe there'll be a lot of incentive to cover a wide area to do as much mapping as possible, you know, with a limited number of flights. To what extent do you think you would spend flight hours understanding vertical structure and yeah. What do you think about that? Okay. Uh, first of all, thanks for the uh, comments about the past work of the P3 in Texas. Um, that was also a very transformative set of studies from the perspective of our laboratory. Uh, and as far as the vertical structure question goes, um, uh, because of the instrumentation that we would like to bring to bear here, we would be getting the sort of information you're talking about from all of the flight hours from both the P3 and the Twin Otter. So the, the scanning Doppler LiDAR systems that we are that we build here in this laboratory uh, provide you that continuous measurement of both the boundary layer depth and the, the wind field of, you know, across the entire area where we can um, uh, bring, you know, where, where we would fly both aircraft. So I think we would address you know, from the meteorological standpoint, the um, the vertical structure very nicely that way. Obviously, aircraft can only fly for so long and for certain periods of time. So you would get that data in in that you know somewhat limited snapshot kind of kind of way. Um, but I would say it's it's a very potentially very detailed meteorological data set. Uh, the other thing that I, I didn't mention, but of course we would plan to do is. Uh, you know, as with each of the flux boxes that we would be flying, uh, we would we would be doing a certain amount of vertical profiling. So uh, dropping down to the lowest flight altitude that's uh, that's reasonably safe, and then spiraling up to some altitude that's well above the mixed layer, and that you know gives us a, a second check on the meteorological variables with the in situ met probes, as well as also giving us the distribution of chemical composition to the extent that we do see any variations uh, with altitude. Um, you know, as we go about our flights. Um, so I hope that answers your question or at least begins to address your question. If mm -hmm. I didn't answer it, please follow up. Yeah, it's a good answer. I, I know spirals consume flight hours, but I do think it's important. So I, you know, I think it would be important to have several spirals during each flight so that you can 
put together the horizontal and the vertical. Well, yeah, and the spirals are very important for the satellites too, right? Because the satellites have different sensitivity vertically as well. Excellent point. Um, different question. Uh, the chemical environment over the Gulf, it's very different than overland, of course. And, you know, halogen chemistry is important. And, you know, I think we have some indication from measurements at the coastline by Professor Flynn's group that how important that chemistry is. Would you be bringing instrument packages that would also gather data on chlorine chemistry and or iodine chemistry? Would that be in the mission? The short answer is yes. Uh, so the standard way to do that these days is with uh, an iodide sim, uh, iodide ion chemical ionization mass spectrometer. That's one of our core instruments for the P3. It me measures a whole mm -hmm. suite of halogen compounds. Um, CLNO2 is one we've done a lot of work with in the past uh, in Texas, but certainly measures a variety of others. Um, we typically don't get iodine chemistry from that instrument uh, because it uses iodide as a reagent ion. So that makes us blind to iodine chemistry, but we do have spectroscopic instruments that are capable of measuring iodine monoxide, uh, which is also part of our core package. Great, if you can get IO, uh, Jimmy Flynn made uh, open path IO measurements on coast of Galveston. So there's a, there's a data set there that you could refer to. And um, maybe very good. Maybe, it sounds it sounds like Jimmy and I should talk. Yeah. Uh, and maybe just to, to add context to what I said that for other everyone, the the iodine chemistry is very important to ozone over the it's destroying ozone. And you know, you can easily be wrong by a factor of two in ozone if you're not accounting for that. And the chlorine chemistry is potentially important to methane destruction potentially, depending on how active it is. So it's, they're definitely relevant to um, mission objectives here. Um, yeah, what, one other quick note on that is also to say that um, we, we do have the capacity for eddy covariance flux that does apply to ozone. So we have fast ozone on the aircraft uh, and that ozone deposition is related to that iodine monoxide chemistry. Um, quite intimately. So those are those are data sets that would be uh, useful to connect if we're able to do that. Sounds great. Um, I was, I kind of think the NOx lifetime in the atmosphere over the Gulf is uncertain uh, and that models are getting it wrong and have too long of a lifetime because we're missing some chemical sink and I don't know what it is. Um, so I wondered whether any of your flights would be pseudo Lagrangian, where you could track the evolution of an air mass, perhaps downwind of a NOx source. And perhaps this isn't in your main mission, but it would be interesting. Yeah, I, well, so I think the key word there is pseudo in front of Lagrangian. It's extremely difficult to do true Lagrangian flight patterns. Um, but I also think that we would be able to address questions related to the lifetime of NOx by looking at, uh, well, of course, we'd measure total reactive nitrogen NOI also with fast response instruments. So we'd be able to look at the evolution of NOx into NOI that normally gives you a time scale, even if you're not trying specifically to do Lagrangian flights. Um, and then of course we have all the, uh, the speciated reactive nitrogen that goes with that nitric acid and pan and aerosol nitrate mm -hmm. and things of that nature. Um, so uh, I, I think we would be able to constrain things from, for, for nitrogen from a process standpoint, certainly. And I think the grid boxes that we envision for the mass balance would by some level of default sample different air mass ages. And in some cases may also resample the same plume at different points downwind from a source. I feel like Brian's being left out here. Uh, okay. so. well, I'll, right. I'll, I'll defer to him for the next answer. <laughs> I'm actually going to uh, jump in here too because I do want to give the committee a chance to comment yeah. if any uh, members would like to. I see uh, James Flynn has his, uh, his uh, card up, so please. Oops, that was cards down, yeah. 
Um, no, I, I think I'm, I'm excited with the, with the new satellites that have come online. Uh, I think, you know, getting some in situ measurements and helping to validate those measurements over the Gulf where we really don't have any observational strategy, obviously, as, as we've talked about, um, is, is a good idea. I, in the, in the, the proposal, it talked about there was another potential, um, project with the P3. And I'm assuming that we're talking the P3 on both of these, the, the twin otter, if it's going to be based out of Texas, is probably not going to have the legs to really get out very far um, into this, into the region. I'm, I'm assuming you're looking mostly off of Louisiana. Uh, is that right? I think that's, that's correct. The, P, the twin otter doesn't have a lot of range. Uh, what we typically will do is refuel at the airport closest to the source so we will you know we'll we'll get fuel wherever we can get it close to where we want to sample and then and do a research flight from there regardless of where we're based but we still don't have very much range to get very far offshore only only the p3 can do that okay how if as i said there was a, there we saw that there was another proposal um in the in the larger packet that talked about leveraging the p3 how do these play together um, is it enough, you know? So I may not be familiar with the proposal you're referring to. I, uh, hopefully I've got, um, I'm understanding oh, what we're talking about here. Maybe Molly can help me out. Yeah, yeah. So what we did, um, Steve and Brian was we, the Gulf has specific needs to look at uncertainties to the inventory. And so they focus more on the twin otter and the facility, based and uh, headquarters focus more on the basin based. Yes. Okay. So I believe these are, but yes. So there are two studies, two different objectives, but um, we, we regard this as an integrated uh, set of measurements. If that answers your question. Yeah. And I guess before this proposal, were, were y'all not considering going into the Gulf or? Uh, it's just a question of the scope of what we would have done in the Gulf. So uh, air maps is a nationwide effort. We're trying to get all the, all the onshore oil and gas basins together with selected urban text, test beds uh, over the course of sort of three to five years. We would expect to fly in the Gulf, but we wouldn't expect to fly five times in the Gulf uh, without, without the support. So yes, we would like to cover it. This will help us cover it, I think, in a more statistically robust way. Okay, thanks. Great. All right. Well, um, I think uh, we're just uh, on time here, but thank you very much. It sounds like a great proposal. And uh, 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 Greg, thank you very much for your uh, your comments. Um, now we'll move on to the Pacific uh, Regional Office. And uh, I believe Jeremy Porter is going to uh, introduce the next uh, uh, presentation. Is that correct? I am. Can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry, Potter. I'm messing up with my uh, pronunciation today here. No worries. Um, hello, everybody. I am Jerry Potter. I'm the Environmental Sciences Section Chief in the Boeing Pacific Region Office. I apologize for not being able to be there in person. I believe that I've maybe only met half of the current COSA members, and most of those interactions were likely eight or more years ago before I came to Boeing from NOAA. So there's a lot of pro probably a lot to talk about and discuss. And Katrin, I'm really sad that I keep missing chances to see you in person. Um, I may be wrong, but I believe that only a very few of the current COSA members have had a substantive introduction to, specific to the Boeing Pacific region. Things like our structure, our current activities, our studies prioritization process. We certainly don't have time for that now, but here are a few key pieces of information, all related to the evolution of the region that I think are worth keeping in mind for future discussions. The Pacific region has seen an incredible number of changes over its 47 year history. Regional activities have evolved in response to changes in the geographic area of activity and study, change in the emphasis of research disciplines, change in the status of the Southern California planning area from a frontier to a mature oil and gas producing area, and more recently, even decommissioning. Change to include frontier areas for renewable energy development, offshore California, Oregon, and Hawaii, and now leasing activities. Interest in marine sand resources, offshore California, and then more recently, the potential for critical marine minerals. And most recently, the major expansion of our jurisdiction to include the Pacific territories, Guam, CNMI, and American Samoa. So offshore wind has been the biggest driver of change. 
Prior to offshore wind gaining significant traction on the West Coast around 2021, the Pacific region was in somewhat of a static situation. We were largely focused on an ongoing mature conventional energy program. There was a lot of talk and discussion about renewable energy, but frankly, no major progress. We were easily the smallest region from a personnel perspective, a total of only about 32 people. There wasn't much national attention on the work that we did. Things now are very different. We are still by far the smallest region with about 50 people, but that represents more than a 60% increase in just a few years. Regardless, the workload has increased much faster and we're still one deep in many positions and zero deep in several. We've always strived to meaningfully engage with tribal communities or tribal governments and indigenous communities, but offshore wind planning and leasing has taken that to a level that we have never experienced before. We are certainly working quite hard at it, but I do think it's accurate to say that we are struggling to keep up. Given the focus of this COSA meeting on environmental studies, the region has and continues to evolve its approach to environmental studies planning. Kathy Dunkel, our regional studies coordinator, and I have worked hard to design and implement our regional approach in a manner that complements the bone-wide ESP process. I expect that many of you might have a lot of questions about what that means, and I'd be happy to talk with any of you in more detail. But in the meantime, there is also a pretty informative and still quite relevant presentation about the Pacific Region Environmental Studies Planning Process available online from a prior COSA meeting. So with all that context, I wanna quickly pivot to why we're here today. The Pacific Region is particularly interested in your thoughts, recommendations, and feedback on one particular study, study profile. Impacts to floating offshore wind, subsurface infrastructure, the hydrodynamics, biogeochemistry, and primary productivity in the Pacific OCS. Timing of today's discussion is particularly helpful given that the Pacific Region staff, supervisors, and managers will be meeting late next week to discuss all of our studies currently under consideration for funding. Information from the discussion today will be included in that meeting and the subsequent leadership team deliberations that ultimately prioritize the list of Pacific Region studies that we recommend to headquarters for funding. So thank you in advance for your time and attention on this discussion. And with that, I can't think of a better person to represent the Pacific Region today than Dr. Alice Kojima Clark. Alice joined the Pacific Region as a Presidential Management Fellow last October. I could provide a bunch of laudatory remarks about her accomplishment and expertise, but I don't think that's really necessary. All I wanna say is that I always wanna surround myself with somebody that, or with people that are much smarter than me, people that I know I can count on, and people that are ready and willing to help when asked. And that is Alice. And the Pacific region is incredibly fortunate to have her on the team. And though Alice is giving the presentation, I also wanna highlight someone else that's there today, Tom Kilpatrick. Tom is a physical oceanographer that works out of Boehm OEP, the headquarters office. However, he's been helping out the Pacific region for several years because the oceanographer position here was one of the ones that we've been zero deep in for a while. Fortunately, with Alice on board as of last fall, we're now just one deep. So the Pacific region continues to owe a big thanks to OEP and Tom for his continued help and assistance over the years. It has been incredible. So since Alice came on board, she and Tom have been working together on the Pacific region activities related to potential upwelling impacts, and that includes this profile. So with that long-winded introduction, I'd like to pass it over to Alice. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for that kind introduction. Um, Zoe, whenever you have a minute. Okay. So with that, I think you all know who I am and what profile I'm presenting, but I just wanna say thank you for this opportunity to present this to you all as the COSA committee and for your time and attention on this topic. And I just welcome any feedback you have to make this profile better. Not sure if this clicker is working. Do I need to point it at you maybe? Okay, sorry. <laughs> All right, so the California current flows along the Pacific coast of the US and it is highly productive due to the upwelling of deep nutrient rich waters to the surface. And this nutrient delivery system, um, it makes this area uh, livable for organisms of all trophic levels and it creates the backbone for the marine, coastal, and human environments of the West Coast. So what I'm showing you here is satellite imagery of a phytoplankton bloom off of the West Coast, which you can see in those kind of greenish colors. And I just wanted to illustrate that productive nature of this area um, of the California current ecosystem. So the strong winds that drive this upwelling and this productivity um, are precisely why this area was selected for offshore wind development. Next slide, please. 
the state of California recently funded a model-based study that looked at how these planned offshore winds may influence um, upwelling volume transport. So on the left, there is a schematic from the paper that was published from that study, Raghu Kumar et al. And on the right are some um, of the results from that study, which are uh, modest changes in the total upwelling near hypothetical wind farms off of Morro Bay and Humboldt. And they also found more substantial changes in the spatial distribution of upwelling. Uh, can you click to the next? Thanks. And so there is a follow-on study led by Tom Kilpatrick of Boehm in collaboration with NOAA's Southwest Fisheries Science Center that's expanding on this study and looking at how these changes in upwelling behavior can affect uh, biogeochemistry. So in particular, um, the availability of key nutrients that support primary productivity. And this study is also expanding the geographic region um, to include the Oregon wind energy areas up north. Uh, next slide, please. So both of these studies use the Regional Ocean Modeling System, or ROMS, to simulate the impacts of these floating offshore wind farms um, on the ocean. And they do this by representing the wind farms as a reduction in wind stress at the sea surface, um, also known as a wind wake. Um, and so the, essentially the change in the wind field interacts with the surface ocean and results in this measurable change in, um, in upwelling. And so an important knowledge gap that still exists, however, is, uh, next slide please, What's going on below the surface? How does the subsurface infrastructure of these floating um, offshore wind farms impact the ocean? This is kind of that, that ocean wake effect. Um, next, please. And also, how does this ocean wake interact with the wind wake to influence local circulation? So without resolving how flow structure interactions below the surface um, uh, impact the the California current ecosystem. We're not getting the full full picture of what's happening here. And I do want to say that this is a uniquely Pacific issue, at least at the moment, because of the deep nature of the outer continental shelf in the Pacific and this required floating technology. But I hear that um, there may be other sites with floating technology soon. Um, so next slide, please. So what we are proposing, um, for this study is a separate modeling study that looks at how hydrodynamics, biogeochemistry, and primary productivity are influenced by the semi-submersible type of floating substructure, which is uh, the most likely uh, type of technology that will be used for Pacific floating offshore wind. Next slide, please. You can just click through the next few bullets if you don't mind, Zoe, thanks. Um, so the approach that we're planning to take is, um, is a little bit different because we can't tackle this problem with the same um, model configuration and framework that has been used for those previous studies, the, the ROMS studies, um, because we need to be able to distinguish um, finer scale changes that are happening in the currents below and around these floating substructures and the related ecosystem impacts. And so um, what we're proposing is using the MIT GCM model coupled to an ecosystem model, which would be able to simulate hydrodynamics more at the, the 10 meter scale and the related biogeochemistry and primary, primary productivity changes. And so the idea is to compare this model output against a configuration that lacks any kind of wind farm, so a no turbine control, which would help us attribute the changes we're seeing to the wind farms themselves. We're also hoping to compare it against a configuration that lacks the ocean wake, so below the surface, or the no ocean wake control, um, which would help attribute the changes to um, the ocean wake versus just the, the wind wake. And then we can also compare this no ocean wake control to the previous studies that I mentioned that use ROMs because those were essentially uh, no ocean wake simulations as well. And so that would kind of help help show what the role of the model selected is. So my background is more in climate science. And so if you think about future climate projections, you always have many different models showing their projections, right? So in a similar way, I think it's it's good science to use 
uh, different types of models for doing this. Um, and then I also want to mention that for that control where you don't have any wind farms, uh, we plan to validate these simulations with relevant and available observations. Next slide, please. So in addition to the questions that I've already brought up, um, we also want to get a sense of how this ocean wake plus wind wake will influence uh, ocean stratification and thermocline depth. Um, this is an area that's still not well understood. There have been, I believe, a couple studies that have looked at this for the fixed bottom monopile type of uh, wind farm, but not yet for floating. Um, and then uh, next bullet is um, another question, which is we know that natural variability and climate change are already um, leading to changes in these parameters that I'm talking about, but how does that differ from what the offshore wind farms will be potentially uh, doing? And then next bullet. Um, finally, I also want to mention that um, one question on our mind too is how the results of this modeling study can be used to inform a, uh, a monitoring effort that focuses on the smaller turbine scale uh, interaction. So this question really comes from the recent uh, report that was published by the National Academies that looked at the impacts of offshore wind farms on hydrodynamics, specifically in the Nantucket Shoals region, which I realize is not the Pacific, but I think it can still be applied here, which is that we need to have a um, intentional strategy for monitoring at different scales. So they recommended the turbine scale, the wind farm scale, and the regional scale. So to think about how to target these different scales and not kind of group everything together. So what we're hoping is that this study does, you know, target that smaller turbine scale and can then inform how best to observe any changes that may happen at that scale. Um, next slide, please. Um, so with that, I do want to open it up to hear any feedback from COSA and any experts that may have been invited, but um, just to kind of get the conversation going, I did want to mention that um, I realize that there are kind of higher powered models out there that could simulate even smaller scale than what I'm talking about. However, I think it's it's a balance between that and what, what frameworks are already in place for looking at more of the downstream effects. So for example, with, you know, with MIT GCM, there is this um, Darwin ecosystem model that is kind of ready to go and works well together and can help us look at more, you know, what are the what does the phytoplankton look like? And I think with upwelling being such a huge concern for the Pacific, for the stakeholders in terms of how it will affect fisheries, I think it will help us extrapolate to higher trophic levels by, by using this approach. Um, so yeah, with that, I, I open it up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice. And this is a really uh, interesting topic. So um, I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of comments I will. Uh, uh, we have invited several guests to to make a few comments to uh, to begin with. Uh, our, our, uh, Michael uh, 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 Jay Cox is he on? And uh, Ken Hughes and Robert uh, Dorrell. Would 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 you three like to uh, comment on the uh, on the um, the proposal? Hi, Mike. Hi. Ken. Hi. Yes. Hi. Maybe I'll jump in first. Um, so yeah, I'm Mike Jaycox and I'm a physical oceanographer uh, working at NOAA, um, working between fisheries and, and OAR, the um, Oceanic and Atmospheric Research Labs, um, and have done some work on the, the upwelling uh, piece of this, the sort of wind-driven part and not the in-water part. Um, so I guess I'll start by saying that I do think this is an important open question to address this this impact of the in-water structures. So I appreciate the work you're doing to to uh, push that forward. Um, I have a couple, I guess, general sort of questions and comments or things to consider. I guess one main one is around the realism of the simulations and whether this is more of an idealized approach to the problem or um, or a more realistic configuration. Um, I think it says 10 meter resolution ish in, in the briefing book, which to me makes me think it's probably more of an idealized approach. Um, and so there, I guess, just things to consider are how realistically the model is simulating the biogeochemistry in particular. Um, and then 
uh, like you you mentioned the sort of putting the changes in the context of natural variability um and so in particular things like natural changes in the mixed layer depth or the thermocline depth um, that will probably alter the impacts of the structures um, and then the last thing on that thread is just the intercomparability with the rom studies which i think in principle sounds really good but may in practice be hard unless this model is really extending to those sort of hundreds of kilometers scales downstream of the of the wind farms um and then i guess the one other thing i'll say before passing it off is um just whether uh this study will consider like or or how the study will consider changes in the context of climate change sort of the magnitude of the expected wind farm effects versus what might happen under um you know the projected changes that we expect anyway thank you for those comments mike i think those are all really great points that i think we definitely need to consider um yeah i'm just gonna leave it at that thanks, thanks. <laughs> Um, perhaps I can jump in next, uh, Robert Drell, uh, Professor of Fluid Mechanics, uh, University of Hull, UK. Um, I was sitting there nodding along uh, to a, a lot of what Mike said, completely agreed with it. Um, first thing I wanted to say, um, thanks uh, to, to Jeremy, um, Alice and, and Tom. Uh, that was a, a really excellent and very interesting introduction uh to a, a perspective um program um it's got certainly a lot of merit to it uh, but i do think there are um some real key questions uh to tackle um, and address around it um certainly running through my list of, of of notes here um i do think there is um a significant question of scale um, to consider in, in all of these problems. Um, by scale, I really mean um, the question um, of the area of deployment of offshore wind farms um, on the West Coast uh, versus um, the area uh, occupied by the, uh, the California current itself. And um, is deployment ever going to be large enough uh, to have significant impacts um, at anything beyond local scale. And I think some back of the envelope calculations could start to uh, give some interesting answers to that um, uh, in, in fairly short order. Um, as far as the modeling goes, uh, that certainly is the way to proceed with things um, for the time being. Well, obviously there's no infrastructure in the water there yet, so you're constrained um, from doing any direct observations so you do need to rely on models um, however as Mike um, alluded to there are some real challenges um, with the hydrodynamic models as stands at the moment um, there aren't any real um, proper physical closures uh, to describe wake mixing uh, processes especially in stratified waters um, and therefore any uh, ROMS type model uh, is going to have um, an unspecified, uncharacterized amount of error uh, to it. Um, and it may well be that further work is needed to properly characterize the amount of mixing um, that is uh, occurring um, behind infrastructure in the, in the near field um, to properly parameterize larger scale models. Um, also from your proposal, it wasn't really apparent how you were going to integrate wakes into um, your uh, into your models. There are lots of different approaches here, uh, all the way from taking very very simplistic um, wake deficit um, models, uh, sort of a mean field reduction in wind speed, uh, to more dynamic and perhaps realistic models of um, the atmosphere. Um, you had some very interesting comments um, around um, real world observation, moving towards real world observation. Um, and right at the start of the day uh, today, we heard a little bit about um, the use of DAS uh, uh, for uh, distributed um, 
acoustic sensing, um, you can do the same thing, obviously, with temperature, uh, DTS, uh, to get seabed temperatures coupled with uh, sea surface measurements of temperature that may well give some interesting um, analysis of uh, mixing processes uh, in oceanographic environments. Um, and I would suggest that there are lessons that could be learned by considering other um, artificial structures in the marine environments, such as um, studies uh, from existing oil and gas platforms. Thank you so much, Robert. I read your 2022 paper, so it's exciting to have you here. <laughs> uh, thanks Thank for those you. comments. I'll definitely look into the DTS comment you made in particular. Thanks. Right, so that leaves me. I'm Ken Hughes. I'm a physical oceanographer. Um, I kind of focus on the small, the smaller scale. So I've done a lot of stuff with flows past obstacles. You know, I've been involved in some of the sort of preliminary type simulations that might have uh, helped this proposal come to be. Um, what Alice didn't show is that if you go to Europe and you look at those sort of shelf sea, shallow water monobile platforms, you can see the effects pretty pretty clearly what they have. You can see the sediment stirred up behind them. So you take a picture from satellite, this underwater effect kind of shows up. Now, you go to floating platforms that don't really exist anywhere yet you know, at a large scale. So there's bound to be some kind of effect that's similar to, um, to this, what we see in Europe, but we just don't know what it is. Um, that Reku Kumar paper that she cited at the beginning, I found that immensely useful. They kind of find this quote modest effect, maybe like a five percent um, scale, and I think that's really useful to know what the wind's doing and how that's going to change the system. My best guess, not that I, it's I would put much money behind it, but my guess is we're going to see a similar modest effect from these platforms. But whether that's one percent, whether it's five percent, whether it's ten percent, and how how far that extends, I think is a big. Uh, open question. Um, yes, but I think we're going to get a lot of local hotspots as a result. And when you get local hotspots that might extend out a kilometre or half a kilometre behind each platform, you multiply that by the hundreds of platforms, it adds up to a lot. I think. And I think to answer Mike's, one of Mike's points, um, whether this is an idealized versus some kind of realistic thing. I think that's actually maybe a strength of this proposal and that it's probably going to tend toward idealized and you maybe look at individual platform, you do that really well and then you can scale that up as the, the build out changes. I imagine it inevitably will, you know, go from maybe 900 platforms and it scales back and we kind of, we can predict the different um, consequences we're going to get as that plan changes. Uh, and then I think the one question I maybe had is, goes toward this, as we do build it out, does BOLM have any kind of plans to do this, maybe local scale measurement to see these effects as this is uh, being developed? Um, I think there's definitely going to be a need for that moving forward. It's just a matter of if it is small enough scale, it may be more in the realm of the developers to be doing that kind of work. But I think there's opportunity for kind of collaboration to to get that done because obviously it's it's definitely needed. Um, yeah. Thanks, Ken. If I can jump back in um, on the note of collaboration, um, whilst there isn't much floating offshore wind in the North Sea. Um, yet there is some. Um, there are um, already five existing reasonably large programs um, in the UK studying this exact problem in various different guises, um, eco wind, eco flow, um, e suites, and, and aura um, that are investing significant amounts of, of money and time and resources into this, um, I, I would uh, encourage and be very supportive of collaboration, um, sharing best practice and knowledge. 
And I'll jump in there as well. There's a, there is a program at UMass Amherst looking at the, uh, at, at uh, um, floating offshore wind and and how to 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 anchor it. And and there might be um, it, it's not directly related to your current flow, but as far as different kinds of structures and and formats. So we, we thank you. Uh, for, for for the guests, we do have a couple of committee members uh, with their hands up. Dan Costa and then and then Patron. Yeah, I was really looking forward to this session. I I was very excited to see that Bohm had put this out because I'm one of the people that's I think most of you know at the top of the food chain worrying about marine mammals and seabirds. I've been participating in a number of working groups to try and talk about California offshore wind, and I worry that we worry that we focused on move, the animals' movements, this, that, and the other thing, and often it comes up, well, what about primary production? What about the food web? And we keep coming to that, and I was hoping you guys would give us some answers. So <laughs> I guess my only comment is, what do we really need to know to at least start to bound the problem? Are these going to be likely major effects, minimal effects? Do we even have the realm of you know, can, can we even bound the question in terms of the level of potential effects, given we know so little? And then what do we need to do to just start to bound that question? And so, again, I say that as somebody at the top of the food chain trying to predict the impacts on the critters that I study. So thank you very much. Was, this was very informative. Thanks. Great. Gotcha. Yeah, thanks for that presentation. Uh, so I'm coming from uh, not an oceanography position, position or a wind position or anything. So my question is really um, more from a conceptual design, experimental design, I guess, uh, perspective. Uh, first of all, what Robert said about scale was forefront on my mind too. I was like, how many of these wind farms are actually there compared to the region? But that, thanks for bringing that up, Robert. But I guess my other questions were, I was very happy to see that there was sort of basically validation and back checking with observational data on this, particularly in a climate change um, context or just even into annual variability context. Um, but for that to be useful, I guess your observations need to be happening at that same small scale as your wind farm modeling is happening. And I'm not sure, I'm just asking, do you have the data on you know, of natural variability on that fine scale. Um, and then the other question is the selection of these control areas. Um, I do a lot of benthic work and we oftentimes say, oh, we have this impact area. Now we want this control area. And it's one of the hardest things to do is find an area that you can argue that it's really more or less the same as everything else, except for that one thing that you add in your case, your, the wind farm. Um, and so uh, what sort of are your approaches to make sure that your control areas are actual control areas, that they that they are the same from all other processes other than the one factor that you're trying to model? Sorry, can you say what your name was? Katrina, it's really nice to meet you. Thank you for your questions. Um, so your first question was asking about observations at similar scale. I might actually boot that question over to Jack Bart, who I see is on the call, if he wouldn't mind, because I know that there are, um, I mean, when I was thinking about validating with observations, I was thinking about glider data, but it's just a matter of, it may be a few points, it may not be a lot, but um, yeah, Jack, any insights on that? <laughs> well, I think we could get at some of the uh, wind farm scale effects around the large, larger areas. If you really wanted to get down to each structure, you got to do a much higher resolution study with DTS, toad DTS, or um, microstructure profiling, et cetera, things that are being done and contemplated for the Atlantic work. But I think at the at the uh, wind farm scale, above it, below it, we can get at it with some in situ observational work. But I, I had another question, but I'll let you finish, Alice. Okay. Well, thank you for that uh, input, Jack. Um, and I think too, it's an opportunity for, again, like I was saying, collaboration with with the developers in the future, because I think you'll be, you know, that's something that they could be putting some kind of sensor on each of the platforms that they have. And so I know at least on the East Coast, there is this 
concerted effort to develop consistent monitoring um, that um, kind of all the developers are, are playing into. But ideally, that's what would end up happening on the Pacific. Um, and then your second question was asking about the control and how is it truly a control? I guess this might be my naivete of not being a modeler by training, but I just had assumed that you can, you know, we're simulating what's going on offshore, let's say California, for example, and then we are introducing the the wind parameterization, the wind stress. And so I don't think it's, it's not, it wouldn't be a separate area. It would all be the same in theory. Um, is is that kind of getting at what you were so asking? So no, then I might have misunderstood you. So okay. your control and your, your treatment basically are just for the modeling. You're yes. not, you, okay, that's okay. Yeah, okay, sorry thank that. you, sorry for, yeah. yeah. Thanks, uh, Jack, did you see you had a question? Sure, so I really like where this is headed and I like the logical progression and how the community has been going into this. So we've seen the wind effects looked at on the circulation, um, but I'm super excited about this, this study that's going on right now, I think led by Tom and others to get into the water for the biogeochemistry. So that would get to Dan's question. Is it a 5% effect? Is it 1%? Is it 10%? And, and then, then we can go that next step. Okay, let's put in the interaction with the flow uh, due to the structures. But can you say anything about how that present study is going, Alice or Tom? Or Mike, maybe I'll boot that over to you. <laughs> Yeah, I can say a little bit. I guess the um, so this gets into my like focus on the real realistic versus idealized is that my high level takeaway is that I think there are signals and it's very challenging to pull the signals from the noise. Like this is a really and on the observational side, it's going to be even harder than on the modeling side. So, I mean, we really need a lot of focus. Well. Well, either we can say if we can't do that, then the signal isn't big enough to matter. Um, but but that's really where we are putting a ton of effort right now is in is in the signal to noise question. I mean, the California current, the biogeochemistry of the California current, as Dan and Jack and others know well, is is extremely variable. I, I had a couple of uh, comments too on this one. I was uh, interested to, to, to read and I thought everyone's uh, comments and questions have been re really insightful on it. Um, the, uh, so the, the, the um, floating wind farms are also going to be used in the, uh, in the Gulf of Maine. And, and I, I encourage you to make sure you uh, communicate with those, those people that are working on that over there for the, um, for the Atlantic coast, um, Chen, Dr. Chen and his uh, group with the FVCOM have been doing a lot of modeling. They've had to take it down to the resolution of meters to get the uh, turbine and the tidal impact around the monopoles. And uh, but they, it is a three dimensional model, and they have been working with that. They've also um, uh, been working on on the cumulative effect of more than one farm. And so, in, in thinking about your your model and the scales to go on the fine scale but it's also probably important to think on the very large scale and it's where whereas you know you you run the model for one one farm for, for example it doesn't seem to have an effect but cumulatively those firms ha do seem to have an effect and uh, he's still in the process of working through it but um but that's the latest presentation i've seen so you might want to reach a e even as a just a comparison model uh to the mit um one you might want to think think about that can you say what his name was again? Sorry. It, it's a, a Professor Chao Se Chen. Uh, he's at you and what self promotion. He's at he's in he's in my school. Okay. So yeah. Thanks. How big are the, those plumes going to be? Are you know the disturbances and how? So are they going to be big enough to interact with each other? If, you know, you of course you have to know what the scale between the different wind farms are, but make it be really important to also figure out what the scale of that disturbance is going to be, because that might guide how you place wind farms, wind farm installations, what's the distances between. Yeah, that's a great point. And um, I think uniquely too, the Pacific 
wind turbines are they're floating and they're, they're moving right they're not fixed in place so there definitely is that possibility of interaction and originally when I wrote this profile I was uh, actually considering not just the semi-submersible type but the um, what is it the the spar type and a, a couple others too to just kind of compare um, because I thought it could be kind of more of a a mitigation angle based on what we see, we can, you know, actually select a certain type of floating substructure, but it seems like um, the general consensus is that the semi-submersal is, is the way to go, which is why I kind of honed in on one to make it kind of more of a digestible uh, profile. But I think that's definitely a possibility, especially in terms of um, for NEPA in the future and mitigation measures to look at um, how, how that interacts and maybe ways to, to prevent and to mitigate. Um, Thanks for that question. Uh, yeah, Dan, you had another yeah, comment? I, it's a restatement. I mean, Mike said something I think is incredibly, incredibly important. California current is incredibly variable. And this speaks to the issue of controls. And I've fought, I think most of my career, I've been fighting this idea that you can do a control in the California current to, to study a before, do a classic but before, after control, because the baseline is shifting. We have climate change. It's already an incredibly variable system that even a few years of data won't really give you a, a trajectory. So it's just a challenge that we have to recognize and that the some of our classic thinking about, oh, we'll do a control, we'll study it for a year or two and then have a baseline is just, it's just not realistic. So we have to think about this as a dynamic environment. And what Mike said is just absolutely on target, but it, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to grasp that. Yeah, I I would I would second that, and also it is, for some reason the 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 primary productivity and so I mean, what we found with the ICTIA fund is it's a little it's a little hard to con convince people to fund work on that. So it you know it's it's good to good to be focused on it right on the right on the start, but. With the again another example of that that modeling, um, if, if you can work with the wind farm companies as soon as possible to try and figure out what kind of grid they're going to be putting the the wind farms on, that can be really helpful because I know in in in, in Dr. Chen's case, they modeled the whole thing on a three nautical mile grid and then they turned around and 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 the wind farms put it on a one nautical mile grid and so they had to redo the whole whole thing so. You, you got to kind of work in sync with those the the companies right off right off the bat. Any any other comments on this or no? Well, with that, I will uh, thank you, Alice, for a great presentation. Thank, thank you. you, the guests, for your insightful comments. And uh, we've come to that that part of the meeting where it's it's uh, unless there's any comments on the general. Uh, overview it's it's uh, my closing remarks and uh, i'm gonna go with shakespeare and say brevity is the soul of wit and so just say thank you all for uh for coming in a great day and interesting talks and 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 uh really thoughtful conversation and we'll look forward to tomorrow so thank you very much <laughs>